Section 13 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 13. Book 28. Chapters 46 to 61. Chapter 46. Remedies for Diseases of the Head and for Alopecy. Bear's grease mixed with ladanum and the plant adiantum prevents the hair from falling off. It is a cure also for alopecy and effects in the eyebrows mixed with the fungus from the wick of a lamp and the soot that is found in the nozzle. Used with wine, it is good for the cure of Parisio, a malady which is also treated with the ashes of deer's horns in wine. This last substance also prevents the growth of vermin in the hair. For Parisio, some persons employ goat's gall in combination with simoleon chalk and vinegar, leaving the preparation to dry for a time on the head. Sow's gall, too, mixed with bull's urine, is employed for a similar purpose, and when old, it is an effectual cure, with the addition of sulphur, for furfuraceous eruptions. The ashes, it is thought, of an ass's genitals, will make the hair grow more thickly, and prevent it from turning grey. The proper method of applying it being to shave the head, and to pound the ashes in a leaden mortar with oil. Similar effects are attributed to the genitals of an ass's foal, reduced to ashes and mixed with urine, some nard being added to render the mixture less offensive. In case of alopecy, the part affected is rubbed with bull's gall, warmed with Egyptian alum. Running ulcers of the head are successfully treated with bull's urine or stale human urine in combination with cyclaminos and sulphur, but the most effectual remedy is calf's gall, a substance which heated with vinegar has also the effect of exterminating lice. Veal suet pounded with salt and applied to ulcers of the head is a very useful remedy. The fat, too, of the fox is highly spoken of, but the greatest value is set upon cat's dung, applied in a similar manner with mustard. Powdered goat's horns, or the horns reduced to ashes, those of the he-goat in particular, with the addition of nitre, tamarisk seed, butter and oil, are remarkably effectual for preventing the hair from coming off, the head being first shaved for the purpose. So too the ashes of burnt goat's flesh, applied to the eyebrows with oil, impart to them a black tint. By using goat's milk, they say, lice may be exterminated, and the dung of those animals, with honey, is thought to be a cure for alopecy. The ashes, too, of the hoofs, mixed with pitch, prevent the hair from coming off. The ashes of a burnt hair, mixed with oil of myrtle, alleviate headache. The patient drinking some water that has been left in the trough, after an ox or ass has been drinking there. The male organs of a fox, worn as an amulet, are productive, if we choose to believe it of a similar effect. The same too with the ashes of a burnt deer's horn, applied with vinegar, rose oil, or oil of iris. Chapter 47. Remedies for Affections of the Eyes. For defluxions of the eyes, beef suet boiled with oil is applied to the parts affected, and for eruptions of those organs, Ashes of burnt deer's horns are similarly employed, the tips of the horns being considered the most effectual for the purpose. For the cure of cataract, it is reckoned a good plan to apply a wolf's excrements. The same substance, too, reduced to ashes, is used for the dispersion of films, in combination with attic honey. Bear's gall, too, is similarly employed, and for the cure of epinictus, Wild boar's lard mixed with oil of roses is thought to be very useful. An ass's hoof reduced to ashes and applied with ass's milk 
is used for the removal of marks in the eyes and indurations of the crystalline humours. Beef marrow from the right foreleg, beaten up with soot, is employed for affections of the eyebrows and for diseases of the eyelids and corners of the eyes. For the same purpose also, a sort of calibre farum is prepared from soot, the best of all being that made from a wick of papyrus mixed with oil of sesame, the soot being removed with a feather and caught in a new vessel prepared for the purpose. This mixture too is very efficacious for preventing superfluous eyelashes from growing again when once pulled out. Bull's gall is made up into eye salves with white of egg, these salves being steeped in water and applied to the eyes for four days successively. Veal suet with goose grease and the extracted juice of osimum is remarkably good for diseases of the eyelids. Veal marrow with the addition of an equal proportion of wax and oil or oil of roses an egg being added to the mixture is used as a liniment for indurations of the eyelids. Soft goat's milk cheese is used as an application with warm water to allay defluxions of the eyes, but when they are attended with swelling, honey is used instead of the water. In both cases, however, the eyes should be fermented with warm whey. In cases of dry ophthalmia, it is found a very useful plan to take the mussels lying within a loin of pork and after reducing them to ashes, to pound and apply them to the part affected. She-goats, they say, are never affected with ophthalmia from the circumstance that they browse upon certain kinds of herbs. The same too with the gazelle. Hence it is that we find it recommended at the time of a new moon to swallow the dung of these animals coated with wax. As they are able to see, too, by night, it is a general belief that the blood of a he-goat is a cure for those persons affected with dimness of sight, to whom the Greeks have given the name of nyctalopes. A similar virtue is attributed to the liver of a she-goat, boiled in astringent wine. Some are in the habit of rubbing the eyes with the thick gravy, which exudes from a she-goat's liver roasted or with the gall of that animal. They recommend the flesh also as a diet and say that the patient should expose his eyes to the fumes of it while boiling. It is a general opinion too that the animal should be of a reddish colour. Another prescription is to fumigate the eyes with the steam arising from the liver boiled in an earthen jar or, according to some authorities, roasted. Goat's gall is applied for numerous purposes, with honey or film, repeat, with honey for films upon the eyes, with one third part of white hellebore for cataract, with wine for spots upon the eyes, indurations of the cornea, films, webs and argema, with extracted juice of cabbage, for diseases of the eyelids, the hairs being first pulled out, and the preparation left to dry on the parts affected, and with woman's milk for rupture of the coats of the eye. For all these purposes, the gall is considered the most efficacious when dried. Nor is the dung of this animal held in disesteem, being applied with honey for defluxions of the eyes. The marrow, too, of a goat, or a hare's lights, we find used for pains in the eyes, and the gall of a goat, with raisin wine or honey, for the dispersion of films upon those organs. It is recommended also for ophthalmia to anoint the eyes with wolf's fat or swine's marrow. We find it asserted too that persons who carry a wolf's tongue inserted in a bracelet will always be exempt from ophthalmia. Chapter 48 Remedies for Diseases and Affections of the Ears Pains and diseases of the ears are cured by using the urine of a wild boar. Kept in a glass vessel or the gall of a wild boar, swine or ox, mixed with castor oil and oil of roses in equal proportions. But the best remedy of all is bull's gall, warmed with leek juice or with honey, if there is any suppuration. Bull's gall, too, warmed by itself in a pomegranate rind, 
is an excellent remedy for offensive exhalations from the ears. In combination with woman's milk, it is efficacious as a cure for rupture of those organs. Some persons are of opinion that it is a good plan to wash the ears with this preparation in cases where the hearing is affected, while others again, after washing the ears with warm water, insert a mixture composed of the old slough of a serpent and vinegar wrapped up in a docile of wool. In cases, however, where the deafness is very considerable, gall warmed in a pomegranate rind with myrrh and rue is injected into the ears. Sometimes also fat bacon is used for this purpose, or fresh asses dung, mixed with oil of roses. In all cases, however, the ingredients should be warmed. The foam from a horse's mouth is better still, or the ashes of fresh horse dung mixed with oil of roses. Fresh butter too is good. Beef suet mixed with goose grease, the urine of a bull or she-goat, or fuller's lant, heated to such a degree that the steam escapes by the neck of the vessel. For this purpose also, one third part of vinegar is mixed with a small portion of the urine of a calf, which has not begun to graze. They apply also to the ears calf's dung, mixed with the gall of that animal, and sloughs of serpents, care being taken to warm the ears before the application, and all the remedies being wrapped in wool. Veal suet, too, is used with goose grease and extract of osimum, or else veal marrow mixed with bruised cumin and injected into the ears. For pains in the ears, the liquid ejected by a boar in copulation is used, due care being taken to receive it before it falls to the ground. For fractures of the ears, a glutinous composition is made from the genitals of a calf, which is dissolved in water when used. And for other diseases of these organs, fox's fat is employed. Goat's gall mixed with rose oil warmed, or else extracted juice of leek. In all cases where there is any rupture, these preparations are used in combination with woman's milk. Where a patient is suffering from hardness of hearing, ox gall is employed with the urine of a he or she goat. The same too where there is any suppuration. Whatever the purpose for which they are wanted, it is the general opinion that these substances are more efficacious when they have been smoked in a goat's horn for 20 days. Hare's rennet, too, is highly spoken of. Taken in a Minian wine, in the proportion of one third of a denarius of rennet to one half of a denarius of sycopanum. Bear's grease mixed with equal proportions of wax and bull suet is a cure for hypothumes of the parotid glands. Some persons add hypothesis to the composition or else content themselves with employing butter only. After first fermenting the parts affected with a decoction of fenugreek, the good effects of which are augmented by strychnos. The testes too of the fox are very useful for this purpose, as also bull's blood, dried and reduced to powder. She-goat's urine made warm is used as an injection for the ears, and a liniment is made of the dung of those animals in combination with axle grease. Chapter 49. Remedies for Toothache The ashes of deer's horns strengthen loose teeth and allay toothache, used either as a friction or as a gargle. Some persons, however, are of opinion that the horn, unburnt and reduced to powder, is still more efficacious for all these purposes. Dentifrices are made both from the powder and the ashes. Another excellent remedy is a wolf's head reduced to ashes. It is a well-known fact, too, that there are bones generally found in the excrements of that animal. These bones attached to the body as an amulet are productive of advantageous effects. For the cure of toothache, hare's rennet is injected into the ear. The head also of that animal, reduced to ashes, is used in the form of a dentifrice, and with the addition of nard, is a corrective of bad breath. Some persons, however, think it is a better plan to mix the ashes of a mouse's head 
with the dentifrice. In the side of the hair, there is a bone found similar to a needle in appearance. For the cure of toothache, it is recommended to scarify the gums with this bone. The paste and bone of an ox, ignited and applied to loose teeth which ache, has the effect of strengthening them in the sockets. The same bone reduced to ashes and mixed with myrrh is also used as a dentifrice. The ashes of burnt pig's feet are productive of a similar effect, as also the calcined bones of the cotyloid cavities in which the hip bones move. It is a well-known fact that introduced into the throat of beasts of burden, these bones are a cure for worms, and that, in a calcined state, they are good for strengthening the teeth. When the teeth have been loosened by a blow, they are strengthened by using ass's milk or else ashes of the burnt teeth of that animal, or a horse's lichen, reduced to powder and injected into the ear with oil. By lichen I do not mean the hippomanes, a noxious substance which I purposely forbear to enlarge upon, but an excrescence which forms upon the knees of horses and just above the hooves. In the heart of this animal there is also found a bone which bears a close resemblance to the eye-teeth of a dog. If the gums are scarified with this bone, or with a tooth taken from the jawbone of a dead horse, corresponding in place with the tooth affected, the pain will be removed, they say. Anaxilaeus assures us that if the liquid which exudes from a mare when covered is ignited on the wick of a lamp, it will give out a most marvellous representation of horses' heads and the same with reference to the she-ass. As to the hippomanes, it is possessed of properties so virulent and so truly magical, that if it is only thrown into fused metal, which is being cast into the resemblance of an Olympian mare, it will excite in all stallions that approach it a perfect frenzy for copulation. Another remedy for diseases of the teeth is joiner's glue, boiled in water and applied care being taken to remove it very speedily and instantly to rinse the teeth with wine in which sweet pomegranate rind has been boiled. It is considered also a very efficacious remedy to wash the teeth with goat's milk or bull's gall. The paste and bones of a she-goat just killed reduced to ashes and indeed to avoid the necessity for repetition of any other four-footed beast reared in the farmyard, are considered to make an excellent dentifrice. Chapter 50. Remedies for Diseases of the Face It is generally believed that ass's milk effaces wrinkles in the face, renders the skin more delicate, and preserves its whiteness. And it is a well-known fact that some women are in the habit of washing their face with it 700 times daily, strictly observing that number. Poppea, the wife of the Emperor Nero, was the first to practice this. Indeed, she had sitting baths, prepared solely with ass's milk, for which purpose whole troops of she-asses used to attend her on her journeys. Purulent eruptions on the face are removed by an application of butter, but white lead mixed with the butter is an improvement. Pure butter alone is used for Sir Piginus eruptions of the face, a layer of barley meal being powdered over it. The call of a cow that has just calved is applied, while still moist, to ulcers of the face. The following recipe may seem frivolous, but still, to please the women, it must not be omitted. The paste and bone of a white steer, they say, boiled forty days and forty nights, till it is quite dissolved, and then applied to the face in a linen cloth, will remove wrinkles and preserve the whiteness of the skin. An application of bull's dung, they say, will impart a rosy tint to the cheeks, and not crocodilia even is better for the purpose. The face, however, must be washed with cold water, both before and after the application. Sunburns and all other discolorations of the skin are removed by the aid of calves' dung, kneaded up by hand with oil and gum. Ulcerations and chaps of the mouth by an application of veal or beef suet, mixed with goose grease and juice of osimum. 
There is another composition also made of veal suet, with stag's marrow and leaves of white thorn, the whole beaten up together. Marrow too mixed with resin, even if it be cow marrow only, is equally good, and the broth of cow beef is productive of similar effects. A most excellent remedy for the lichens on the face is a glutinous substance prepared from the genitals of a male calf. Melted with vinegar and live sulphur, and stirred together with a branch of a fig tree. This composition is applied twice a day and should be used quite fresh. This glue, similarly prepared from a decoction of honey and vinegar, is a cure for leprous spots, which are also removed by applying a he goat's liver warm. Elephantiasis, too, is removed by an application of goat's gall, and leprous spots and furfuraceous eruptions by employing bull's gall with the addition of nitrate or else ass's urine about the rising of the dog star. Spots on the face are removed by either bull's gall or ass's gall, diluted in water by itself, care being taken to avoid the sun or wind after the skin has peeled off. A similar effect is produced also by using bull's gall or calf's gall in combination with seed of unilla and the ashes of a deer's horn, burnt at the rising of canicula. Ass's fat in particular restores the natural colour to scars and spots on the skin caused by lichen or leprosy. A he-goat's gall mixed with cheese, live sulphur and sponge reduced to the ashes effectively removes freckles, the composition being brought to the consistency of honey before being applied. Some persons, however, prefer using dried gall and mix with it warm bran in the proportion of one obolus to four oboli of honey, the spots being rubbed briskly first. He goat suet, too, is highly efficacious, used in combination with gith, sulphur and iris, this mixture being also employed with goose grease, stag's marrow, resin and lime for the cure of cracked lips. I find it stated by certain authors that persons who have freckles on the skin are looked upon as disqualified from taking any part in the sacrifices prescribed by the magic art. Chapter 51. Remedies for diseases of the tonsillary glands and for scrofula. Cow's milk or goat's milk is good for ulcerations of the tonsillary glands and of the trachea. It is used in the form of a gargle, warm from the udder or heated, goat's milk being the best, boiled with mallows and a little salt. A broth made from tripe is an excellent gargle for ulcerations of the tongue and trachea, and for diseases of the tonsillary glands. The kidneys of a fox are considered a sovereign remedy, dried and beaten up with honey and applied externally. For quinsy, Bull's gall or goat's gall is used mixed with honey. A badger's liver taken in water is good for offensive breath and butter has a healing effect upon ulcerations of the mouth. When a pointed or other substance is stuck in the throat by rubbing it externally with cat's dung, the substance they say will either come up again or pass downwards into the stomach. Scrofulous sores are dispersed by applying the gall of a wild boar or of an ox, warmed for the purpose. But it is only when the sores are ulcerated that hare's rennet is used, applied in a linen cloth with wine. The ashes of the burnt hoof of an ass or horse, applied with oil or water, is good for dispersing scrofulous sores. Warmed urine also, the ashes of an ox's hoof taken in water, goat's dung boiled in vinegar, or the testes of a fox. Soap too is very useful for this purpose, an invention of the galls for giving a reddish tint to the hair. This substance is prepared from tallow and ashes, the best ashes for the purpose being those of the beech and yolk elm. There are two kinds of it, the hard soap and the liquid, both of them much used by the people of Germany, the men in particular more than the women. Chapter 52. Remedies for pains in the neck. For pains in the neck, 
The part should be well rubbed with butter or bear's grease, and for a stiff neck with beef suet, a substance which, in combination with oil, is very useful for the cure of scrofula. For the painful cramp attended with inflexibility, to which people give the name of apisthotone, the urine of a she-goat injected into the ears is found very useful, as also a liniment made of the dung of that animal mixed with bulbs. In cases where the nails have been crushed, it is an excellent plan to attach them to the gall of any kind of animal. Whitlows upon the fingers should be treated with dried bull's gall, dissolved in warm water. Some persons are in the habit of adding sulphur and alum of each an equal weight. Chapter 53. Remedies for cough and for spitting of blood. A wolf's liver administered in mulled wine is a cure for cough. A bear's gall also mixed with honey. The ashes of tips of cow horn, or else the saliva of a horse taken in the drink for three consecutive days, in which last case the horse will be sure to die, they say. A deer's lights are useful for the same purpose, dried with the gullet of the animal in the smoke, and then beaten up with honey and taken daily as an electuary. The spitter deer, be it remarked, is the kind that is the most efficacious for the purpose. Spitting of blood is cured by taking ashes of burnt deer's horns, or else a hare's rennet, in drink, in doses of one-third of a denarius, with Samian earth and myrtle wine. The dung of this last animal, reduced to ashes and taken in the evening with wine, is good for coughs that are recurrent at night. The smoke, too, of a hare's fur inhaled has the effect of bringing off from the lungs such humours as are difficult to be discharged by expectoration. Purulent ulcerations of the chest and lungs and bad breath, proceeding from a morbid state of the lungs, are successfully treated with butter boiled with an equal quantity of attic honey, till it assumes a reddish hue, a spoonful of the mixture being taken by the patient every morning. Some persons, however, instead of honey, prefer using larch resin for the purpose. In cases where there are discharges of blood, cow's blood, they say, is good, taken in small quantities with vinegar. But as to bull's blood, it would be a rash thing to believe in any such recommendation. For inveterate spitting of blood, bull glue is taken in doses of three oboli in warm water. Chapter 54 Remedies for Affections of the Stomach Ulcerations of the stomach are effectually treated with ass's milk or cow's milk. For gnawing pains in that region, beef is stewed with vinegar and wine. Fluxes are healed by taking the ashes of burnt deer's horn and discharges of blood by drinking the blood of a kid, just killed, made hot in doses of three cyathi with equal proportions of vinegar and tart wine, or else by taking kid's rennet with twice the quantity of vinegar. Chapter 55. Remedies for liver complaints and for asthma. Liver complaints are cured by taking a wolf's liver dried in honeyed wine, or by using the dried liver of an ass, with twice the quantity of rock parsley and three nuts, the whole beaten up with honey and taken with the food. The blood, too, of a he-goat is prepared and taken with the food. For persons suffering from asthma, the most efficient remedy of all is the blood of wild horses taken in drink. For persons suffering from asthma, the most efficient remedy of all is the blood of wild horses taken in drink, and next to that, ass's milk boiled with bulbs the whey being the part used, with the addition of nasturtium, steeped in water and tempered with honey, in the proportion of one cyathus of nasturtium to three semisextari of whey. The liver or lights of a fox, taken in red wine or bear's gall in water, facilitate the respiration. Chapter 56. Remedies for Pains in the Loins for pains in the loins and all other affections which require emollients, frictions with bear's grease should be used. 
or else ashes of stale boar's dung or swine's dung should be mixed with wine and given to the patients. The magicians too have added to this branch of medicine their own fanciful devices. In the first place of all, madness in he-goats, they say, may be effectually calmed by stroking the beard, and if the beard is cut off, the goat will never stray to another flock. To the above composition they add goat's dung, and recommend it to be held in the hollow of the hand, as hot as possible. A greased linen cloth being placed beneath, and care being taken to hold it in the right hand, if the pain is on the left side, and in the left hand if the pain is on the right. They recommend also that the dung employed for this purpose should be taken up on the point of a needle made of copper. The mode of treatment is for the patient to hold the mixture in his hand till the heat is felt to have penetrated to the loins, after which the hand is rubbed with a pounded leek and the loins with the same dung annealed with honey. They prescribe also for the same malady the testes of a hare to be eaten by the patient. In cases of sciatica, they are for applying cow dung warmed upon hot ashes in leaves. And for pains in the kidneys, they recommend a hare's kidneys to be swallowed raw or perhaps boiled, but without letting them be touched by the teeth. If a person carries about him the pastern bone of a hare, he will never be troubled with pains in the bowels, they say. Chapter 57 Remedies for Affections of the Spleen Affections of the spleen are alleviated by taking the gall of a wild boar or hog in drink, ashes of burnt deer's horns in vinegar, or what is best of all, the dried spleen of an ass, the good effects being sure to be felt in the course of three days. The first dung voided by an ass's foal, a substance known as palea, by the people of Syria, is administered in oxymel for these complaints. A dried horse tongue, too, is taken in wine, a sovereign remedy which Cecilius Bion tells us he first heard of when living among the barbarous nations. The milk of a cow or ox is used in a similar manner, but when it is quite fresh, the practice is to roast or boil it and take it with the food. For pains in the liver, a topical application is made by bruising twenty heads of garlic in one sextarius of vinegar and applying them in a piece of ox bladder. For the same malady, the magicians recommend a calf's milt, bought at the price set upon it and without any haggling, that being an important point, and one that should be religiously observed. This done, the milt must be cut in two lengthwise and attached to the patient's shirt on either side after which the patient must put it on and let the pieces fall at his feet, and must then pick them up and dry them in the shade. While this last is doing, the diseased liver of the patient will gradually contract, they say, and he will eventually be cured. The lights, too, of a fox are very useful for this purpose, dried on hot ashes and taken in water. The same, too, with a kid's milt, applied to the part affected. Chapter 58. Remedies for Bowel Complaints To arrest looseness of the bowels, deer's blood is used, the ashes also of deer's horns, the liver of a wild boar, taken fresh and without salt in wine, a swine's liver roasted, or that of a he-goat, boiled in five semi-sextari of wine, a hare's rennet boiled in quantities the size of a chickpea, in wine or, if there are symptoms of fever, in water. To this last, some persons add nut galls, while others again content themselves with hare's blood boiled by itself in milk. Ashes, too, of burnt horse dung are taken in water for this purpose, or else ashes of the part of an old bull's horn, which lies nearest the root, sprinkled in water. The blood, too, of a he-goat boiled upon charcoal, or a decoction made from a goat's hide boiled with the hair on. For relaxing the bowels, a horse's rennet is used, or else the blood marrow or liver of a she-goat. A similar effect is produced by applying a wolf's gall to the navel, with elaterium by taking mare's milk, goat's milk with salt and honey, 
or a she-goat's gall with juice of cyclaminos, and a little alum, in which last case some prefer adding nitre and water to the mixture. Bull's gall, too, is used for a similar purpose, beaten up with wormwood and applied in the form of a suppository, or butter is taken in considerable doses. Celiac affections and dysentery are cured by taking cow's liver, ashes of deer horns, a pinch in three fingers swallowed in water, hare's rennet kneaded up in bread, or, if there is any discharge of blood, taken with polenta, or else boar's dung, swine's dung, or hare's dung, reduced to ashes and mixed with mulled wine. Among the remedies also for the celiac flux and dysentery, veal broth is reckoned, a remedy very commonly used. If the patient takes ass's milk for these complaints, it will be all the better if honey is added, and no less efficacious for either complaint are the ashes of ass's dung taken in wine, or else polia, the substance above mentioned. In such cases, even when attended with a discharge of blood, we find a horse's rennet recommended by some persons known as hippus, ashes of burnt horse dung, horse's teeth pounded and boiled cow's milk. In cases of dysentery, it is recommended to add a little honey and for the cure of griping pains, ashes of deer's horns, bull's gall mixed with cumin or the flesh of a gourd should be applied to the navel. For both complaints, new cheese made of cow's milk is used as an injection. Butter also in the proportion of four semi-sextari to two ounces of turpentine, or else employed with a decoction of mallows or with oil of roses. Veal suet or beef suet is also given, and the marrow of those animals is boiled with meal, a little wax and some oil, so as to form a sort of pottage. This marrow too is kneaded up with bread for a similar purpose, or else goat's milk is used boiled down to one half. In cases too where there are gripings in the bowels, wine of the first running is administered. For the last name pains, some persons are of opinion that it is a sufficient remedy to take a single dose of hare's rennet in mulled wine, though others again, who are more distrustful, are in the habit of applying a liniment to the abdomen made of goat's blood, barley meal and resin. For all the defluxions of the bowels, it is recommended to apply soft cheese and for celiac affections and dysentery, old cheese. Powdered, one syathus of cheese being taken in three syathi of ordinary wine. Goat's blood is boiled down with the marrow of those animals for the cure of dysentery and the celiac flux is effectually treated with the roasted liver of a she-goat, or what is still better, the liver of a he-goat, boiled in astringent wine, and administered in the drink, or else applied to the navel with oil of myrtle. Some persons boil down the liver in three sextari of water, to half a sextarius, and then add rue to it. The milt of a he or she-goat is sometimes roasted for this purpose or the suet of a he-goat is incorporated in bread baked upon the ashes. The fat, too, of a she-goat taken from the kidneys more particularly is used. This last, however, must be taken by itself and swallowed immediately, being generally recommended to be taken in water moderately cool. Some persons, too, boil goat suet in water, with a mixture of polenta, cumin, anise and vinegar and for the cure of celiac affections, they rub the abdomen with a decoction of goat's dung and honey. For both the celiac flux and the dysentery, kid's rennet is employed, taken in myrtle wine, in pieces the size of a bean, or else kid's blood, prepared in the form of a dish, known by the name of sanguiculus. For dysentery, an injection is employed, made of bull glue dissolved in warm water. Flatulency is dispelled by a decoction of calf's dung in wine. For intestinal affections, deer's rennet is highly recommended, boiled with beef and lentils and taken with the food. Hare's fur also reduced to ashes and boiled with honey, or boiled goat's milk, 
taken with a small quantity of mallows and some salt. If rennet is added, the remedy will be all the more effectual. Goat suet, taken in any kind of broth, is possessed of similar virtues, care being taken to swallow cold water immediately after. The ashes of a kid's thighs are said to be marvellously efficacious for intestinal hernia, as also hare's dung boiled with honey and taken daily in pieces the size of a bean. Indeed, these remedies are said to have proved effectual in cases where a cure has been quite despaired of. The broth, too, made from a goat's head, boiled with the hair on, is highly recommended. Chapter 59 Remedies for Tenesmus, Tapeworm and Affections of the Colon The disease called tenesmus, or in other words a frequent and ineffectual desire to go to stool, is removed by drinking ass's milk or cow's milk. The various kinds of tapeworm are expelled by taking the ashes of deer's horns in drink. The bones which we have spoken of as being found in the excrements of the wolf, worn attached to the arm, are curative of diseases of the colon, provided they have not been allowed to touch the ground. Pelea, too, a substance already mentioned, is remarkably useful for this purpose. Boiled in grape juice, the same too with swine's dung, powdered and mixed with cumin in a decoction of rue. The antler of a young stag, reduced to ashes and taken in wine, mixed with African snails, crushed with the shells on, is considered a very useful remedy. Chapter 60 Remedies for Affections of the Bladder and for Urinary Calculi Diseases of the bladder and the torments attendant upon calculi are treated with the urine of a wild boar or the bladder of that animal taken as food, both of them being still more efficacious if they have been thoroughly soaked first. The bladder when eaten should be boiled first, and if the patient is a female it should be a sow's bladder. There are found in the liver of the wild boar certain small stones or what in hardness resembles small stones, of a white hue, and resembling those found in the liver of the common swine. If these stones are pounded and taken in wine, they will expel calculi, it is said. So oppressed is the wild boar by the burden of his urine, that if he has not first voided it, he is unable to take to flight, and suffers himself to be taken as though he were enchained to the spot. This urine, they say, has a consuming effect upon urinary calculi. The kidneys of a hare, dried and taken in wine, act as an expellent upon calculi. We have already mentioned that in the gammon of the hog, there are certain joint bones. A decoction made from them is remarkably useful for urinary affections. The kidneys of an ass, dried and pounded, and administered in undiluted wine, are a cure for diseases of the bladder. The excrescences that grow on horses' legs, taken for 40 days in ordinary wine, or honeyed wine, expel urinary calculi. The ashes, too, of a horse's hoof, taken in wine or water, are considered highly useful for this purpose. And the same with the dung of a she-goat. If a wild goat, all the better, taken in honeyed wine, Goat's hair, too, is used, reduced to ashes. For carbuncles upon the generative organs, the brains and blood of a wild boar or swine are highly recommended. And for serpiginous affections of those parts, the liver of those animals is used, burnt upon juniper wood more particularly, and mixed with papyrus and arsenic. The ashes also of their dung, ox gall kneaded to the consistency of honey, with Egyptian alum and myrrh, beetroot boiled in wine being laid upon it, or else beef. Running ulcers of those parts are treated with veal suet and marrow, boiled in wine, or with the gall of a she-goat, mixed with honey and the extracted juice of the bramble. In cases where these ulcers are serpiginous, it is recommended to use goat's dung with honey or vinegar, or else butter by itself. Swellings of the testes are reduced by using veal suet with nitre, or the dung of an animal boiled in vinegar. 
The bladder of a wild boar, eaten roasted, acts as a check upon incontinence of urine. A similar effect being produced by the ashes of the feet of a wild boar or swine sprinkled in the drink. The ashes of a sow's bladder taken in drink, the bladder or lights of a kid, a hare's brains taken in wine, the testes of a male hare grilled, the rennet of that animal taken with goose grease and polenta, or the kidneys of an ass beaten up and taken in undiluted wine. The magicians tell us that after taking the ashes of a boar's genitals in sweet wine, the patient must make water in a dog kennel and repeat the following formula. This I do, that I may not wet my bed as a dog does. On the other hand, a swine's bladder attached to the groin facilitates the discharge of the urine, provided it has not already touched the ground. Chapter 61. Remedies for diseases of the generative organs and of the fundament. For diseases of the fundament, a sovereign remedy is bear's gall, mixed with the grease, to which some persons are in the habit of adding litharge and frankincense. Butter too is very good, employed with goose grease and oil of roses. The proportions in which they are mixed will be regulated by the circumstances of the case, care being taken to see that they are of a consistency which admits of their being easily applied. Bull's gall upon lint is a remarkably useful remedy and has the effect of making chaps of the fundament cicatrise with great rapidity. Swellings of those parts are treated with veal suet, that from the loins in particular, mixed with rue. For other affections, goat's blood is used with polenta. Goat's gall, too, is employed by itself for the cure of condylomata, and sometimes wolf's gall mixed with wine. Bear's blood is curative of inflamed tumours and apostemes upon these parts in general, as also bull's blood dried and powdered. The best remedy, however, is considered to be the stone which the wild ass voids with its urine. It is said at the moment he is killed. This stone, which is in a somewhat liquefied state at first, becomes solid when it reaches the ground. Attached to the thigh, it disperses all collections of humours and all kinds of suppurations. It is but rarely found, however, and it is not every wild ass that produces it, but as a remedy it is held in high esteem. Ass's urine, too, used in combination with gith, is highly recommended. The ashes of a horse's hoof, applied with oil and water, a horse's blood, that of a stone horse in particular, the blood also of an ox or cow, or the gall of those animals. Their flesh too, applied warm, is productive of similar results. The hoofs reduced to ashes and taken in water or honey. The urine of a she-goat, the flesh of a he-goat, boiled in water. The dung of these animals boiled with honey. Or else a boar's gall, or swine's urine, applied in wool. Riding on horseback, we well know, galls and chafes the inside of the thighs. The best remedy for accidents of this nature is to rub the parts with the foam which collects at a horse's mouth. Where there are swellings in the groin arising from ulcers, a cure is effected by inserting in the sores three horse hairs tied with as many knots. End of section 13. Section 14 of The Natural History Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 14. Book 28, Chapter 62 to 81. Chapter 62. Remedies for Gout and for Diseases of the Feet For the cure of gout, bear's grease is employed, mixed in equal proportions with bull suet and wax. Some persons add to the composition hypothesis and nut galls. Others again prefer he-goat suet 
mixed with the dung of a she-goat and saffron, or else with mustard, or sprigs of ivy pounded and used with perdicium, or with flowers of wild cucumber. Cow dung is also used with lees of vinegar. Some persons speak highly in praise of the dung of a calf which has not begun to graze, or else a bull's blood, without any other addition. A fox also boiled alive till only the bones are left. A wolf boiled alive in oil to the consistency of a serrate. He goats you it with an equal proportion of helxin and one-third part of mustard, or ashes of goat's dung mixed with axle grease. They say, too, that for sciatica it is an excellent plan to apply this dunk boiling hot beneath the great toes, and that for diseases of the joints it is highly efficacious to attach bear's gall or hare's feet to the part affected. Gout, they say, may be allayed by the patient always carrying about with him a hare's foot cut off from the animal alive. Bear's grease is a cure for chilblains and all kinds of chops upon the feet. With the addition of alum, it is still more efficacious. The same results are produced by using goat suet, a horse's teeth powdered, the gall of a wild boar or hog, or else the lights of those animals applied with their grease, and this, too, where the soles are blistered, or the feet have been crushed by a substance striking against them. In cases where the feet have been frozen, ashes of burnt hare's fur are used, and for contusions of the feet, the lights of that animal are applied, sliced or reduced to ashes. Blisters occasioned by the sun are most effectually treated by using asses fat or else beef suet with oil of roses. Corns, chaps, and callosities of the feet are cured by the application of wild boar's dung or swine's dung used fresh and removed at the end of a couple of days. The postern bones of these animals are also used reduced to ashes, or else the lights of a wild boar, swine, or deer. When the feet have been galled by the shoes, they are rubbed with the urine of an ass applied with the mud formed by it upon the ground. Corns are treated with beef suet and powdered frankincense. Chilblains with burnt leather, that of an old shoe in particular, and injuries produced by tight shoes with ashes of goatskin tempered with oil. The pains attendant upon varicose veins are mitigated by using ashes of burnt calf's dank, boiled with lily roots and a little honey, a composition which is equally good for all kinds of inflammations and sores that tend to suppurate. It is very useful also for gout and diseases of the joints when it is the dung of a bull calf that is used more particularly. For exoriations of the joints, the gall of a wild boar or swine is applied in a warm linen cloth, the dung also of a calf that has not begun to graze, or else goat dung, boiled in vinegar with honey. Veal suet rectifies malformed nails, as also goat suet mixed with sandarac. Warts are removed by applying ashes of burnt calf's dung in vinegar, or else the mud formed upon the ground by the urine of an ass. Chapter 63. Remedies for Epilepsy In cases of epilepsy, it is a good plan to eat a bear's testes or those of a wild boar with mare's milk or water, or else to drink a wild boar's urine with honey and vinegar, that being the best which has been left to dry in the bladder. The testes also of swine are prescribed, dried and beaten up in sow's milk, the patient abstaining from wine some days before and after taking the mixture. The lights of a hair too are recommended, salted and taken with one-third of frankincense for thirty consecutive days in white wine, 
hares ran it also, and asses' brains smoked with burning leaves, and administered in hydromel in doses of half an ounce per day. An ass's hoofs are reduced to ashes and taken for a month together in doses of two spoonfuls. The test is also of an ass salted and mixed with a drink, ass's milk or water in particular. The second dines also of a she-ass are recommended, more particularly when it is a male that has been foaled. Placed beneath the nostrils of the patient, when the fits are likely to come on, this substance will effectually repel them. There are some persons who recommend the patient to eat the heart of a black he-ass in the open air with bread upon the first or second day of the moon. Others again prescribe the flesh of that animal and others the blood diluted with vinegar and taken for forty days together. Some mix horse tail for this purpose with smithy water fresh from the forge employing the same mixture for the cure of delirium. Epilepsy is also treated with mare's milk or the excrescences from a horse's legs taken in honey and vinegar. The magicians highly recommend goat's flesh grilled upon a funeral pile, as also the suet of that animal boiled with an equal quantity of bull's gall and kept in the gall bladder care being taken not to let it touch the ground, and the patient swallowing it in water standing aloft. The smell arising from a goat's horns or deer's antlers, burned, efficiently detects the presence of epilepsy. In cases where persons are suddenly paralyzed, the urine of an ass's foal, applied to the body with nard, is very useful, it is said. Chapter 64 Remedies for Jaundice For the cure of jaundice, the ashes of a stag's antlers are employed, or the blood of an ass's foal taken in wine. The first dung, too, that has been voided by the foal after its birth, taken in wine, in pieces the size of a bean, will effect a cure by the end of three days. The dung of a newborn colt is possessed of a similar efficacy. Chapter 65. Remedies for Broken Bones For broken bones, a sovereign remedy is the ashes of the jawbone of a wild boar or swine. Boiled bacon, too, tied round the broken bone, united with marvellous rapidity. For fractures of the ribs, goat's dung applied in old wine is extolled as the grand remedy being possessed in a high degree of aperient, extractive and healing properties. Chapter 66. Remedies for Fevers Deer's flesh, as already stated, is a febrifuge. Periodical and recurrent fevers are cured, if we are to believe what the magicians tell us, by wearing the right eye of a wolf, salted and attached as an amulet. There is one kind of fever generally known as amphemerine. It is to be cured, they say, by the patient taking three drops of blood from an ass's ear and swallowing them in two semi sextori of water. For quartan fever, the magicians recommend cat's dung to be attached to the body with the toe of a horned owl and that the fever may not be recurrent, not to be removed until the seventh paroxysm is passed. Who, pray, could have ever made such a discovery as this? And what, too, can be the meaning of this combination? Why, of all things in the world, was the toe of a horned owl made choice of? Other adepts in this art, who are more moderate in their suggestions, recommend for quartan fever the salted liver of a cat that has been killed while the moon was on the wane, to be taken in wine just before the paroxysms come on. The magicians recommend, too, that the toes of the patient should be rubbed with the ashes of burnt cow dung diluted with a boy's urine, and that a hare's heart should be attached to the hands. They prescribe also hare's rennet to be taken in drink just before the paroxysms come on. New goat's milk cheese is also given with honey, the whey being carefully extracted first. 
Chapter 67. Remedies for Melancholy, Lethargy, and Phthisis. For patients affected with melancholy, calf's dung boiled in wine is a very useful remedy. Persons are aroused from lethargy by applying to the nostrils the callosities from an ass's legs, steeped in vinegar, or the fumes of burnt goat's horns or hair, or by the application of a wild boar's liver, a remedy which is also used for confirmed drowsiness. The cure of phthisis is effected by taking a wolf's liver boiled in thin wine, the bacon of a sow that has been fed upon herbs, or the flesh of a she-ass eaten with a broth, this last mode in particular being the one that is employed by the people of Achaia. They say too that the smoke of dried cow dung, that of the animal when grazing, I mean, is remarkably good for phthisis, inhaled through a reed, and we find it stated that the tips of cow's horns are burned and administered with honey in doses of two spoonfuls in the form of pills. Goat suet, many persons say, taken in a pottage of alica, or melted fresh with honeyed wine, in the proportion of one ounce of suet to one syathus of wine, is good for cough and phthisis care being taken to stir the mixture with a sprig of rue. One author of credit assures us that before now a patient whose recovery has been despaired of has been restored to health by taking one syathus of wild goat suet and an equal quantity of milk. Some writers, too, have stated that ashes of burnt swine's dung are very useful mixed with raisin wine as also the lights of a deer, a spitter deer in particular, smoke-dried and beaten up in wine. Chapter 68. Remedies for Dropsy For dropsy, a wild boar's urine is good, taken in small doses in the patient's drink. It is of much greater efficacy, however, when it has been left to dry in the bladder of the animal. The ashes, too, of burnt cow dung, and of bull's dung in particular, animals that are reared in herds, I mean, are highly esteemed. This dung, the name given to which is bolbiton, is reduced to ashes and taken in doses of three spoonfuls to one semisextarius of honeyed wine, that of the female animal being used where the patient is a woman, and that of the other sex in the case of males a distinction about which the magicians have made a sort of grand mystery. The dung of a bull calf is also applied topically for these disease, and ashes of burnt calf's dung are taken with seed of staphylinos in equal proportions in wine. Goat's blood also is used with a marrow, but it is generally thought that the blood of the he-goat is the most efficacious when the animal has fed upon lentisk more particularly. Chapter 69. Remedies for erysipelas and for purulent eruptions. For erysipelas, a liniment of bear's grease is used, that from the kidneys in particular, fresh calf's dung also, or cow dung, dried goat's milk cheese with leeks, or else the fine scrapings of a deer's skin, brought off with pumice stone and bitten up in vinegar. When there is redness of the skin attended with itching, the foam from a horse's mouth is used, or the hoof reduced to ashes. For the cure of purulent eruptions, Ashes of burnt asses' dung are applied with butter, and for the removal of swarthy pimples, dried goat's milk cheese, steeped in honey and vinegar, is applied in the bath, no oil being used. Pustules are treated with ashes of swine's dung, applied with water, or else ashes of deer's antlers. Chapter 70. Remedies for Sprains, Indurations and Boils for the cure of sprains, the following applications are used. Wild boar's dung or swine's dung, calf's dung, wild boar's foam, used fresh with vinegar, goat's dung applied with honey, and raw beef used as a plaster. For swellings, 
swine's tongue is used, warmed in an earthen pot, and beaten up with oil. The best emollient for all kinds of endurations upon the body is wolf's fat, applied topically. In the case of sores which are wanted to break, the most effectual plan is to apply cow dung warmed in hot ashes, or else goat's dung boiled in vinegar or wine. For the cure of boils, beef suet is applied with salt, but if they are attended with pain, it is melted with oil and no salt is used. Goat suet is employed in a similar manner. Chapter 71. Remedies for Burns. The method of testing bull glue. Seven remedies derived from it. For the treatment of burns, Bear's grease is used with lily roots, dried wild boar's dung also, or swine's dung, the ashes of burnt bristles, extracted from plasterer's brushes, beaten up with grease, the pastern bone of an ox, reduced to ashes and mixed with wax, and bull's marrow or deer's marrow, or the dung of a hare. The dung too of a she-goat, they say, will effect a cure without leaving any scars. The best glue is that prepared from the ears and genitals of the bull, and there is no better cure in existence for burns. There is nothing, however, that is more extensively adulterated, which is done by boiling up all kinds of old skins, and shoes even, for the purpose. The Rhodian glue is the purest of all, and it is this that painters and physicians mostly use. The whiter it is, the more highly glue is esteemed. That, on the other hand, which is black and brittle like wood, is looked upon as good for nothing. Chapter 72. Remedies for Affections of the Sinews and for Contusions For pains in the sinews, goat's dung boiled in vinegar with honey is considered one of the most useful remedies, and this even where the sinew is threatened with putrefaction. Strains and contusions are healed with wild boar's dung that has been gathered in spring and dried. A similar method is employed where persons have been dragged by a chariot or lacerated by the wheels or have received contusions in any other way. The application being quite as effectual should the dung happen to be fresh. Some think it a better plan, however, to boil it in vinegar and, if only powdered and taken in vinegar, they vouch for its good effects where persons are ruptured, wounded internally, or suffering from the effects of a fall. Others, again, who are of a more scrupulous tendency, take the ashes of it in water, and the Emperor Nero, it is said, was in the habit of refreshing himself with his drink when he attempted to gain the public applause at the three-horse chariot races. Swine's dung, it is generally thought, is the next best to that of the goat. Chapter 73. Remedies for Hemorrhage Hemorrhage is arrested by applying deer's rennet with vinegar, hare's rennet, hare's fur reduced to ashes, or ashes of burnt ass's dung. The dung, however, of male animals is the most efficacious for this purpose, being mixed with vinegar and applied with wool in all cases of hemorrhage. In the same way, too, the ashes of a horse's head or thigh, or of burnt calf's dung, are used with vinegar. The ashes also of a goat's horns or dung with vinegar. But it is the thick blood that issues from the liver of a he-goat, when cut asunder, that is looked upon as the most efficacious, or else the ashes of the burnt liver of a goat of either sex, taken in wine or applied to the nostrils with vinegar. The ashes, too, of a leather wine bottle, but only when made of he-goat skin, are used very efficiently with an equal quantity of resin for the purpose of stunching blood and knitting together the lips of the wound. A kid's rennet in vinegar or the thighs of that animal, reduced to ashes, are said to be productive of a similar result. Chapter 74 Remedies for Ulcers and Carcinomatous Sores 
ulcers upon the legs and thighs are cured by an application of bear's grease mixed with red earth and those of a serpiginous nature by using wild boar's gall with resin and white lead the jawbone of a wild boar or swine reduced to ashes swine's dung in a dry state or goat's dung made lukewarm in vinegar for other kinds of ulcers butter is used as a detergent and as tending to make new flesh ashes of deer's antlers or deer's marrow or else bull's gall mixed with oil of cypress or oil of iris wounds inflicted with edged weapons are rubbed with fresh swine's dung or with dried swine's dung powdered when ulcers are phagedonic or fistulous bull's gall is injected with leek juice or woman's milk or else bull's blood dried and powdered with a plant cotyledon carcinomatous sores are treated with hair's rennet sprinkled upon them with an equal proportion of capers in wine gangrenes with bear's grease applied with a feather and ulcers of a serpiginous nature with the ashes of an ass's hoofs powdered upon them the blood of the horse corrodes the flesh by virtue of certain septic powers which it possesses dried horse dung too reduced to ashes has a similar effect those kinds of ulcers which are commonly known as phagedonic are treated with the ashes of a cow's hide mixed with honey calf's flesh as also cow dung mixed with honey prevents recent wounds from swelling the ashes of a leg of veal applied with woman's milk are a cure for sordid ulcers and the malignant sore known as cacoithes bull glue melted is applied to recent wounds inflicted with edged weapons the application being removed before the end of three days dried goat's milk cheese applied with vinegar and honey acts as a detergent upon ulcers and goat suet used in combination with wax arrests the spread of serpiginous sores if employed with pitch and sulphur it will effect a thorough cure the ashes of a kid's leg applied with woman's milk have a similar effect upon malignant ulcers for the cure too of carbuncles a sow's brains are roasted and applied chapter seventy five remedies for the each the each in man is cured very effectually by using the marrow of an ass or the urine of that animal applied with the mud it has formed upon the ground butter too is very good as also in the case of beasts of burden if applied with warmed resin bull glue is also used melted in vinegar and incorporated with lime or goat's gall mixed with calcined alum the eruption called boa is treated with cow dung a fact to which it is indebted for its name the itch in dogs is cured by an application of fresh cow's blood which when quite dry is renewed a second time and is rubbed off the next day with strong lye ashes chapter seventy six methods of extracting foreign substances which adhere to the body and of restoring scars to their natural color thorns and similar foreign substances are extracted from the body by using cat's dung or that of she goats with wine the rennet also of any kind of animal that of the hare more particularly with powdered frankincense and oil or an equal quantity of mistletoe or else with bee glue as suet restores scars of a swarthy hue to their natural color and they are equally effaced by using calf's gall made warm medical men add myrrh honey and saffron and keep the mixture in a copper box some too incorporate with it flour of copper chapter seventy seven remedies for female diseases menstruation is promoted by using bull's gall in unwashed wool as a pessary olympias of thebes adds hyssop and nitre 
ashes too of deer's horns are taken in drink for the same purpose and for derangements of the uterus they are applied topically as also bull's gall used as a pessary with opium in the proportion of two oboli it is a good plan too to use fumigations for the uterus made with deer's hair burned hence they say when they find themselves pregnant are in the habit of swallowing a small stone this stone when found in their excrements or in the uterus for it is to be found there as well attached to the body as an amulet is a preventive of abortion there are also certain small stones found in the heart and uterus of these animals which are very useful for women during pregnancy and in travail as to the kind of pumice stone which is similarly found in the uterus of the cow we have already mentioned it when treating of the formation of that animal a wolf's fat applied externally acts emolliently upon the uterus and the liver of a wolf is very soothing for pains in that organ it is found advantageous for women when near delivery to eat wolf's flesh or if they are in travail to have a person near them who has eaten it so much so indeed that it will act as a counter charm even to any noxious spells which may have been laid upon them in case however a person who has eaten wolf's flesh should happen to enter the room at the moment of parturition dangerous effects will be sure to follow the hair too is remarkably useful for the complaints of females the lights of that animal dried and taken in drink are beneficial to the uterus the liver taken in water with samian earth acts as an amenagogue and the rennet brings away the afterbirth due care being taken by the patient not to bathe the day before applied in wool as a pessary with saffron and leek juice this last acts as an expellent upon the dead fetus it is a general opinion that the uterus of a hair taken with a food promotes the conception of male offspring and that a similar effect is produced by using the testes and rennet of that animal it is thought too that a leveret taken from a uterus of its dam is a restorative of fruitfulness to women who are otherwise past childbearing but it is the blood of a hare's fetus that the magicians recommend males to drink while for young girls they prescribe nine pellets of hare's dung to ensure a durable firmness to the breasts for a similar purpose also they apply hare's rennet with honey and to prevent hairs from growing again when once removed they use a liniment of hare's blood for inflations of the uterus it is found a good plan to apply wild boar's dung or swine's dung topically with oil but a still more effectual remedy is to dry the dung and sprinkle it powdered in the patient's drink even though she should be in a state of pregnancy or suffering the pains of childbirth by administering sow's milk with honeyed wine parturition is facilitated and if taken by itself it will promote the secretion of the milk when deficient in nursing women by rubbing the breasts of females with sow's blood they are prevented from becoming too large if pains are felt in the breasts they will be alleviated by drinking ass's milk and the same milk taken with honey has considerable efficacy as an amenagogue stale fat too from the same animal heals ulcerations of the uterus applied as a pessary in wool it acts emolliently upon indurations of that organ and applied fresh by itself or in water when stale it has all the virtues of a depilatory an ass's milk dried and applied in water to the breasts promotes the secretion of the milk and used in the form of a fumigation it acts as a corrective upon the uterus a fumigation made with a burned ass's hoof placed beneath a woman accelerates parturition so much so indeed as to expel the dead fetus even 
Hence it is that it should only be employed in cases of miscarriage, it having a fatal effect upon the living fetus. Asis dung applied fresh has a wonderful effect, they say, in arresting discharges of blood in females. The same too with the ashes of this dung, which, used as a pessary, are very good for the uterus. If the skin is rubbed with a foam from a horse's mouth for forty days together, before the first hair has made its appearance, it will effectually prevent the growth thereof. A decoction, too, made from deer's antlers, is productive of a similar effect, being all the better if they are used quite fresh. Mare's milk, used as an injection, is highly beneficial to the uterus. Where the fetus is felt to be dead in the uterus, the lichens or excrescences from a horse's legs, taken in fresh water, will act as an expellent an effect produced also by a fumigation made with the hoofs or dry dung of that animal. Procedence of the uterus is arrested by using butter in the form of an injection, and indurations of that organ are removed by similarly employing ox gall with oil of roses, turpentine being applied externally in wool. They say, too, that a fumigation made from ox dung acts as a corrective upon procedence of the uterus and facilitates parturition, and that conception is promoted by the use of cow's milk. It is a well-known fact that sterility is often entailed by suffering in childbirth, an evil which may be averted, Olympias of Thebes assures us, by rubbing the parts before sexual intercourse with bull's gall, serpent's fat, verdigris, and honey. In cases, too, where menstruation is too abundant, the external parts should be sprinkled with a solution of calf's gall the moment before the sexual congress, a method which acts emolliently also upon injurations of the abdomen. Applied to the navel as a liniment, it arrests excessive discharges, and is generally beneficial to the uterus. The proportions generally adopted are one denarius of gall, one third of a denarius of opium, and as much oil of almonds as may appear to be requisite, the whole being applied in ship's wool. The gall, too, of a bull calf is beaten up with half the quantity of honey and kept in readiness for the treatment of uterine diseases. If a woman about the time of conception eats roasted veal with the plant Aristolochia, she will bring forth a male child, we are assured. Calf's marrow, boiled in wine and water with a suet, and applied as a pessary, is good for ulcerations of the uterus. The same, too, with fox's fat and cat's dung, the last being applied with resin and oil of roses. It is considered a remarkably good plan to subject the uterus to fumigations made with burnt goat's horns. The blood of the wild goat, mixed with sea palm, acts as a depilatory. The gall of the other kinds of goat, used as an injection, acts emolliently upon callosities of the uterus and ensures conception immediately after menstruation. It possesses also the virtues of a depilatory, the application being left for three days upon the flesh after the hair has been removed. The midwife assures us that she goes urine taken in drink and the dung applied topically will arrest uterine discharges, however much in excess. The membrane in which the kid is enclosed in the uterus, dried and taken in wine, acts as an expellent upon the afterbirth. For affections of the uterus, it is thought a desirable plan to fumigate it with burnt kid's hair, and for discharges of blood, kid's rennet is administered in drink, or seed of henbane is applied. According to Osthenes, if a woman's loins are rubbed with blood taken from the ticks upon a black wild bull, she will be inspired with an aversion to sexual intercourse. She will forget, too, her former love by taking a he-goat's urine in drink, some nard being mixed with it to disguise the loathsome taste. Chapter 78. Remedies for the Diseases of Infants 
For infants, there is nothing more useful than butter, either by itself or in combination with honey. For dentition, more particularly, for soreness of the gums and for ulcerations of the mouth. A wolf's tooth attached to the body prevents infants from being startled and acts as a preservative against the maladies attendant upon dentition, an effect equally produced by making use of a wolf's skin. The larger teeth also of a wolf attached to a horse's neck will render him proof against all weariness, it is said. A hair's rennet applied to the breasts of the nurse effectually prevents diarrhea in the infant suckled by hair. An ass's liver, mixed with a little panax and dropped into the mouth of an infant, will preserve it from epilepsy and other diseases to which infants are liable. This, however, must be done for forty days, they say. An ass's skin, too, thrown over infants, renders them insensible to fear. The first teeth shed by a horse, attached as an amulet to infants, facilitate dentition and are better still when not allowed to touch the ground. For pains in the spleen, an ox's milt is administered in honey and applied topically, and for running ulcers it is used as an application with honey. A calf's milt boiled in wine is beaten up and applied to incipient ulcers of the mouth. The magicians take the brains of a she-goat and, after passing them through a gold ring, drop them into the mouth of the infant before it takes the breast as a preservative against epilepsy and other infantile diseases. Goat's dung attached to infants in a piece of cloth prevents them from being restless, female infants in particular. By rubbing the gums of infants with goat's milk or hare's brains, dentition is greatly facilitated. Chapter 79. Provocatives of Sleep Cato was of opinion that hare's flesh, taken as a diet, is provocative of sleep. It is a vulgar notion, too, that this diet confers beauty for nine days on those who use it. A silly play upon words, no doubt, but a notion which has gained far too extensively not to have had some real foundation. According to the magicians, the goal of a she-goat, but only of one that has been sacrificed, applied to the eyes or placed beneath the pillow, has a narcotic effect. Too profuse perspiration is checked by rubbing the body with ashes of burnt goat's horns mixed with oil of myrtle. Chapter 80. Stimulants for the Sexual Passions Among the aphrodisiacs we find mentioned a wild boar's gall applied externally, swine's marrow taken inwardly, ass's fat mixed with the grease of a gander and applied as a liniment, the virulent substance described by Virgil as distilling from mares when covered, and the dried testes of a horse, pulverized and mixed with a drink. The right testicle also of an ass is taken in a proportionate quantity of wine, or worn attached to the arm in a bracelet, or else the froth discharged by that animal after covering, collected in a piece of red cloth and enclosed in silver, as Osthenes informs us. Salpe recommends the genitals of this animal to be plunged seven times in boiling oil and the corresponding parts to be well rubbed therein. Bielcon says that these genitals should be reduced to ashes and taken in drink, or else the urine that has been voided by a bull immediately after covering. He recommends also that the groin should be well rubbed with earth moistened with his urine. Mouse dung, on the other hand, applied in the form of a liniment, acts as an antiphrodisiac. The lights of a wild boar or swine, roasted, are an effectual preservative against drunkenness. They must, however, be eaten fasting and upon the same day. The lights of a kid, too, are productive of the same effect. Chapter 81. Remarkable Facts Relative to Animals in addition to those already mentioned, there are various other marvellous facts related with reference to these animals. When a horseshoe becomes detached from the hoof, as often is the case, 
if a person takes it up and puts it by, it will act as a remedy for hiccup the moment he calls to mind the spot where he has placed it. A wolf's liver, they say, is similar to a horse's hoof in appearance, and a horse, they tell us, if it follows in the track of a wolf, will burst asunder beneath its rider. The pastern bones of swine have a certain tendency to promote discord, it is said. In cases of fire, if some of the dung can be brought away from the stalls, both sheep and oxen may be got out all the more easily and will make no attempt to return. The flesh of a he-goat will lose its rank smell if the animal has eaten barley bread or drunk an infusion of laser the day on which it was killed. Meat that has been salted while the moon was on the wane will never be attacked by worms. In fact, so great has been the care taken to omit no possible researches that a deaf hare, we find, will grow fat sooner than one that can hear. As to the remedies for the diseases of animals, if a beast of burden voids blood, an injection must be used of swine's tongue mixed with wine. For the maladies of oxen, a mixture of suet is used with quicksilver and wild garlic boiled, the whole beaten up and administered in wine. The fat, too, of a fox is employed. The liquor of boiled horse flesh, administered in their drink, is recommended for the cure of diseased swine, and, indeed, the maladies of all four-footed beasts may be effectually treated by boiling a she-goat whole in her skin along with a bramble frog. Poultry, they say, will never be touched by a fox if they have eaten the dried liver of that animal, or if the cock, when treading the hen, has had a piece of fox's skin about his neck. The same property, too, is attributed to a weasel's gall. The oxen in the Isle of Cyprus cure themselves of gripings in the abdomen, it is said, by swallowing human excrements. The feet, too, of oxen will never be worn to the quick if their hoofs are well rubbed with tar before they begin work. Wolves will never approach a field if, after one has been caught, and its legs broken and throat cut, the blood is dropped, little by little, along the boundaries of the field, and the body buried on the spot from which it was first dragged. The share, too, with which the first furrow in the field has been traced in the current year, should be taken from the plough and placed upon the hearth of the larries, where the family is in the habit of meeting, and left there till it is consumed." So long as this is in doing, no wolf will attack any animal in the field. We will now turn to an examination of those animals which, being neither tame nor wild, are of a nature peculiar to themselves. Summary Remedies, Narratives and Observations 1682 Roman authors quoted M. Varro L. Piso Fabianus, Valerius Antius, Varius Flaccus, Cato the Censor, Servius Sulpicius, Licinius Masser, Celsus, Masurius, Sextius Niger, who wrote in Greek, Bithus of Dyrrachium, Opilius the Physician, Granius the Physician. Foreign authors quoted, Democritus, Apollonius, who wrote the Miruses, Miletus, Artemon, Sextilius, Antaeus, Homer, Theophrastus, Lysimachus, Attalus, Xenocrates, Orpheus, who wrote the Idiophia, Archelaus, who wrote a similar work, Demetrius, Sotira, Lys, Elephantis, Salpe, Olympias of Thebes, Diotimus of Thebes, Iolus, Andreas, Marcion of Smyrna, Aeschines the Physician, Hippocrates, Aristotle, Metrodorus of Skepsos, Iketidas the Physician, Apelles the Physician, Hesiod, Dalion, Cassilius, Bion, who wrote on powers, Anaxileus, King Juba. End of section 14
Section 15 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 15, Book 29, Chapters 1 through 10. Remedies Derived from Living Creatures Chapter 1 The Origin of the Medical Art The Nature and Multiplicity of the Various Remedies Already Described, or which still remain to be enlarged upon, compel me to enter upon some further details with reference to the art of medicine itself. Aware as I am that no one has hitherto treated of this subject in the Latin tongue, and that if all new enterprises are difficult or of doubtful success, it must be one in particular which is so barren of all charms to recommend it, and accompanied with such difficulties of illustration. It will not improbably suggest itself, however, to those who are familiar with this subject, to make inquiry how it is that in the practice of medicine the use of simples has been abandoned, so convenient as they are, and so ready prepared to our hand, and they will be inclined to feel equal surprise and indignation when they are informed that no known art lucrative as this is beyond all the rest, has been more fluctuating or subjected to more frequent variations. Commencing by ranking its inventors in the number of the gods and consecrating for them a place in heaven, the art of medicine, at the present day even, teaches us in numerous instances to have recourse to the oracles for aid. In more recent times again, the same art has augmented its celebrity at the cost perhaps of being charged with criminality, by devising the fable that, that Escalopius was struck by lightning for presuming to raise Tendarius to life. And this example notwithstanding, it has not hesitated to relate how that others, through its agency, have since been restored to life. Already enjoying celebrity in the days of the Trojan War, its traditions from that period have acquired an additional degree of certainty, although in those times, we may remark, the healing art confined itself solely to the treatment of wounds. Chapter 2. Particulars Relative to Hippocrates. Date of the Origin of Clinical Practice and of that of Atroliptics. Its succeeding history, a fact that is truly marvelous, remains enveloped in the densest night, down to the time of the Peloponnesian War, at which period it was restored to light by the agency of Hippocrates, a native of Kos, an island flourishing and powerful in the highest degree, and consecrated to Asclepius. Its being the practice for persons who had recovered from a disease to describe in the temple of that god the remedies to which they had owed their restoration to health, that others might derive benefit therefrom in a similar emergency, Hippocrates, it is said, copied out these prescriptions, and, as our fellow countryman Varro will have it, after burning the temple to the ground, instituted that branch of medical practice which is known as clinics. There was no limit after this to the profits derived from the practice of medicine, for Proticus, a native of Celembria, one of his disciples, founded the branch of it known as atroliptics, and so discovered a means of enriching the very anointers even, and the commonest drudges employed by the physicians. Chapter 3. Particulars Relative to Chrysippus and Aristostratus in rules laid down by these professors, changes were effected by Chrysippus, with a vast parade of words, and after Chrysippus, by Erasistratus, son of the daughter of Aristotle. For the cure of King Antiochus, to give our first illustration of the profits realized by the medical art, Erasistratus received from his son, King Ptolemaeus, the sum of one hundred talents. Chapter 4. The Empiric Branch of Medicine Another sect again, known as that of the empirics, because it based its rules upon the results of experiment, took its rise in Sicily, having for its founder Acron of Agrigentum, a man recommended by the high authority of Empedocles, the physician. Chapter 5. Particulars relative to Herophilus and other celebrated physicians, the various changes that have been made in the system of medicine. These several schools of medicine, long at variance among themselves, were all of them condemned by Herophilus, who regulated the arterial pulsation according to the musical scale, correspondingly with the age of the patient. In succeeding years again, the theories of this sect were abandoned, it being found that to belong to it necessitated an acquaintance with literature. 
Changes, too, were effected in the school, of which, as already stated, Asclepiades had become the founder. His disciple Timison, who at first in his writings implicitly followed him, soon afterwards, in compliance with the growing degeneracy of the age, went so far as to modify his own methods of treatment, which, in their turn, were entirely displaced with the authorization of the late Emperor Augustus by Antonius Musa, a physician who had rescued that prince from a most dangerous malady by following a mode of treatment diametrically opposite. I pass over in silence many physicians of the very highest celebrity, the Kasi, for instance, the Caliptani, the Aronti, and the Rubri, men who received fees yearly from the great, amounting to no less than 250,000 sesterces. As for Quinius Certinius, he thought that he conferred an obligation upon the emperors in being content with 500,000 sesterces per annum, and indeed he proved, by an enumeration of the several houses, that a city practice would bring him a yearly income of not less than 600,000 sesterces. Fully equal to this was the sum lavished upon his brother by Claudius Caesar, and the two brothers, although they had drawn largely upon their fortunes in beautifying the public buildings in Neapolis, left to their heirs no less than thirty millions of sesterces. Such an estate as no physician but Arontius had till then possessed. Next in succession arose Vettius Valens, rendered so notorious by his adulterous connection with Messalina, the wife of Claudius Caesar, and equally celebrated as a professor of eloquence. When established in public favor, he became the founder of a new sect. It was in the same age, too, during the reign of the emperor Nero, that the destinies of the medical art passed into the hands of Thessalus, a man who swept away all the precepts of his predecessors and declaimed with a sort of frenzy against the physicians of every age. But with what discretion and in what spirit we may abundantly conclude from a single trait presented by his character— Upon his tomb, which is still to be seen on the Appian Way, he had his name inscribed as the Iatronicus, the conqueror of the physicians. No stage player, no driver of a three-horse chariot, had a greater throng attending him when he appeared in public. But he was at last eclipsed in credit by Crinus, a native of Massilia, who, to wear an appearance of greater discreetness and more devoutness, united in himself the pursuit of two sciences, and prescribed diets to his patients in accordance with the movement of the heavenly bodies, as indicated by the almanacs of the mathematicians, taking observations himself of the various times and seasons. It was but recently that he died, leaving ten millions of sesterces, after having expended hardly a less sum upon building the walls of his native place and of other towns. It was while these men were ruling our destinies that all at once Charmus, a native also of Massilia, took the city by surprise. Not content with condemning the practice of preceding physicians, he prescribed the use of warm baths as well, and persuaded people, in the very depth of winter even, to immerse themselves in cold water. His patients he used to plunge into large vessels filled with cold water, and it was a common thing to see aged men of consular rank make it a matter of parade to freeze themselves, a method of treatment in favor of which Aeneas Seneca gives his personal testimony, in writings still extant. There can be no doubt whatever that all these men, in the pursuit of celebrity by the introduction of some novelty or other, made purchase of it at the downright expense of human life. Hence those woeful discussions those consultations at the bedside of the patient, where no one thinks fit to be of the same opinion as another, lest he have the appearance of being subordinate to another. Hence, too, that ominous inscription to be read upon a tomb, it was the multitude of physicians that killed me. The medical art, so often modified and renewed as it has been, is still on the change from day to day, and still we are impelled onwards by the puffs which emanate from the ingenuity of the Greeks. It is quite evident, too, that every one among them that finds himself skilled in the art of speech may forthwith create himself the arbiter of our life and death, as though, forsooth, there were not thousands of nations who live without any physicians at all, though not, for all that, without the aid of medicine. Such, for instance, was the Roman people, for a period of more than six hundred years, a people, too, which has never shown itself slow to adopt all useful arts, and which even welcomed the medical art with avidity, 
until, after a fair experience of it, there was found good reason to condemn it. Chapter 6. Who first practiced as a physician at Rome, and at what period? And, indeed, it appears to me not amiss to take the present opportunity of reviewing some remarkable facts in the days of our forefathers connected with this subject. Cassius Hermina, one of our most ancient writers, says that the first physician that visited Rome was Archagathus, the son of Lasanius, who came over from Peloponnesus in the year of the city, 535, Lucius Aemilius and Marcus Livius being consuls. He states also that the right of free citizenship was granted him and that he had a shop provided for his practice at the public expense in the Asilian Crossway, that from his practice he received the name of Vulnerarius, that on his arrival he was greatly welcomed at first, but that soon afterwards, from the cruelty displayed by him in cutting and searing his patients, he acquired the new name of Carnifex, and brought his art and physicians in general into considerable disrepute. That such was the fact we may readily understand from the words of Marcus Cato, a man whose authority stands so high of itself, but that little weight is added to it by the triumph which he gained, and the censorship which he held. I shall, therefore, give his own words in reference to this subject. Chapter 7. The Opinions Entertained by the Romans on the Ancient Physicians Concerning those Greeks, son Marcus, I will speak to you more at length on the befitting occasion. I will show you the results of my own experience at Athens, and that, while it is a good plan to dip into their literature, it is not worthwhile to make a thorough acquaintance with it. They are a most iniquitous and intractable race, and you may take my word as the word of a prophet when I tell you that whenever that nation shall bestow its literature upon Rome, it will mar everything, and that all the sooner if it sends its physicians among us. They have conspired among themselves to murder all barbarians with their medicine, a profession which they exercise for lucre, in order that they may win our confidence and dispatch us all the more easily. They are in the common habit, too, of calling us barbarians, and to stigmatize us beyond all other nations, by giving us the abominable appellation of opisi. I forbid you to have anything to do with physicians. End quote. Chapter 8 evils attendant upon the practice of medicine. Cato, who wrote to this effect, died in his 85th year, in the year of the city 605, so that no one is to suppose that he had not sufficient time to form his experience, either with reference to the duration of the Republic or the length of his own life. Well, then, are we to conclude that he has stamped with condemnation a thing that in itself is most useful? Far from it by Hercules! for he subjoins an account of the medical prescriptions by aid of which he had ensured to himself and to his wife a ripe old age, prescriptions upon which we are now about to enlarge. He asserts also that he has a book of recipes in his possession by the aid of which he treats the maladies of his son, his servants, and his friends, a book from which we have extracted the various prescriptions according to the several maladies for which they are employed." It was not the thing itself that the ancients condemned, but it was the art as then practiced, and they were shocked, more particularly, that man should pay so dear for the enjoyment of life. For this reason it was, they say, that the temple of Asculapius, even after he was received as a divinity, was built without the city, and afterwards on an island. For this reason, too, it was that when, long after the time of Cato, the Greeks were expelled from Italy, the physicians were not exempted from the decree. And here I will improve upon the foresight displayed by them. Medicine is the only one of the arts of Greece that, lucrative as it is, the Roman gravity has hitherto refused to cultivate. It is but very few of our fellow citizens that have even attempted it, and so soon as ever they have done so, they have become deserters to the Greeks forthwith. Nay, even more than this, if they attempt to treat of it in any other language than Greek— they are sure to lose all credit, with the most ignorant even, and those who do not understand a word of Greek, there being all the less confidence felt by our people in that which so nearly concerns their welfare, if it happens to be intelligible to them. In fact, this is the only one of all the arts, by Hercules, in which the moment a man declares himself to be an adept, he is at once believed, there being at the same time no imposture the results of which are more fraught with peril." To all this, however, 
we give no attention, so seductive is the sweet influence of the hope entertained by his ultimate recovery by each. And then besides, there is no law in existence whereby to punish the ignorance of physicians, no instance before us of capital punishment inflicted. It is at the expense of our perils that they learn, and they experimentalize by putting us to death, a physician being the only person that can kill another with sovereign impunity. Nay, even more than this, all the blame is thrown upon the sick man only. He is accused of disobedience forthwith, and it is the person who is dead and gone that is put upon his trial. It is the usage at Rome for the decuries to pass examination under the censorship of the emperor, and for inquisitions to be made at our party walls even. Persons who were to sit in judgment on our monetary matters are sent for to Gades and the very pillars of Hercules, while a question of exile is never entertained without a panel of forty-five men selected for the purpose. But when it is the judge's own life that is at stake, who are the persons that are to hold counsel upon it? but those who the very next moment are about to take it. And yet so it is, that we only meet with our deserts, no one of us feeling the least anxiety to know what is necessary for his own welfare. We walk with the feet of other people, we see with the eyes of other people, trusting to the memory of others we salute one another, and it is by the aid of others that we live. The most precious objects of existence and the chief supports of life are entirely lost to us, and we have nothing left but our pleasures to call our own. I will not leave Cato exposed to the hatred of a profession so ambitious as this, nor yet that senate which judged as he did, but all the same time I will pursue my object, without resting to my purpose the crimes practiced by its adepts, as some might naturally expect. For what profession has there been more fruitful in poisonings, or from which there have emanated more frauds upon wills? And then, too, what adulteries have been committed in the very houses of our princes, even? The intrigue of Eudemus, for example, with Livia, the wife of Drusus Caesar, and that of Valens with the royal lady previously mentioned. Let us not impute these evils, I say, to the art, but to the men who practice it. For Cato, I verily believe, as little apprehended such practices as these in the city, as he did the presence of royal ladies there. I will not accuse the medical art of the avarice, even of its professors, the rapacious bargains made with their patients while their fate is trembling in the balance, the tariffs framed upon their agonies, the monies taken as earnest for the dispatching of patients, or the mysterious secrets of the craft. I will not mention how that cataract must be couched, only in the eye, in preference to extracting it at once, practices all of them which have resulted in one very great advantage, by alluring hither a multitude of adventurers, it being no moderation on their part, but the rivalry existing between such numbers of practitioners that keeps their charges within moderation. It is a well-known fact that Charmus, the physician already mentioned, made a bargain with a patient of his in the provinces that he should have two hundred thousand sesterces for the cure, that the emperor Claudius extorted from Alcon, the surgeon, ten millions of sesterces by way of a fine, and that same man, after being recalled from his exile in Gaul, acquired a sum equally large in the course of a few years. These are faults, however, which must be imputed to individuals only, and it is not my intention to waste reproof upon the dregs of the medical profession, or to call attention to the ignorance displayed by that crew, the violation of all regimen in their treatment of disease, the evasions practiced in the use of warm baths, the strict diet they imperiously prescribe, the food that is crammed into these same patients, exhausted as they are, several times a day, together with a thousand other methods of showing how quick they are to change their mind, their precepts for the regulation of the kitchen, and their recipes for the composition of unguents, it being one grand object with them to lose sight of none of the usual incitements to sensuality, the importation of foreign merchandise, and the introduction of tariffs settled by foreigners would have been highly displeasing to our ancestors, I can readily imagine. But it was not these inconveniences that Cato had in view when he spoke thus strongly in condemnation of the medical art. Theriais is the name given to a preparation devised by luxury, a composition formed of six hundred different ingredients. And this while nature has bestowed upon us such numbers of remedies each of which would have fully answered the purpose employed by itself. The Mithridatic antidote 
is composed of 4 and 50 ingredients, none of which are used in exactly the same proportion, and the quantity prescribed is in some cases so small as the 60th part of one denarius. Which of the gods, pray, can have instructed man in such trickery as this, a height to which the mere subtlety of human invention could surely never have reached? It clearly must emanate from a vain ostentation of scientific skill, and must be set down as a monstrous system of puffing off the medical art. And yet, after all, the physicians themselves do not understand this branch of their profession, and I have ascertained that it is a common thing for them to put mineral vermilion in their medicines, a rank poison, as I shall have occasion to show when I come to speak of the pigments, in place of Indian cinnabar, and all because they mistake the name of the one drug for the other. These, however, are errors which only concern the health of individuals, while it is the practices which Cato foresaw and dreaded, less dangerous in themselves and little regarded practices, in fact, which the leading men in the art do not hesitate to avow, that have wrought the corruption of the manners of our empire. The practices I allude to are those to which, while enjoying robust health, we submit, such, for instance, as rubbing the body with wax and oil, a preparation for a wrestling match by rights, but which, these men pretend, was invented as a preservative of health, the use of hot baths, which are necessary, they have persuaded us, for the proper digestion of the food, baths which no one ever leaves without being all the weaker for it, and from which the more submissive of their patients are only carried to the tomb, potions taken fasting, vomits to clear the stomach, and then a series of fresh drenchings with drink, emasculation, self-inflicted by the use of pitch plasters as depilatories, the public exposure, too, of even the most delicate parts of the female body for the prosecution of these practices. Most assuredly, so it is, the contagion which has seized upon the public morals has had no more fertile source than the medical art, and it continues, day by day even, to justify the claims of Cato to be considered a prophet and an oracle of wisdom, in that assertion of his that it is quite sufficient to dip into the records of Greek genius without becoming thoroughly acquainted with them. Such, then, is what may be said in justification of the Senate and of the Roman people during that period of six hundred years in which they manifested such repugnance to an art by the most insidious terms of which good men are made to lend their credit and authority to the very worst, and so strongly entered their protest against the silly persuasions entertained by those who fancy that nothing can benefit them but what is coupled with high price. I entertain no doubt, too, that there will be found some to express their disgust at the particulars which I am about to give in relation to animals, and yet Virgil himself has not disdained, when, too, there was no necessity for his doing so, to speak of ants and weevils, and nests by beetles made that shun the light. Homer, too, amid his descriptions of the battles of the gods, has not disdained to remark upon the veracity of the common fly. Nor has nature, she who engendered man, thought it beneath her to engender these insects as well. Let each, then, make it his care, not so much to regard the thing itself as to rightly appreciate in each case the cause and its effects. Chapter 9. Thirty-five Remedies Derived from Wool I shall begin, then, with some remedies that are well known, those, namely, which are derived from wool and from the eggs of birds, thus giving due honor to those substances which hold the principal place in the estimation of mankind, though at the same time I shall be necessitated to speak of some others out of their proper place, according as occasion may offer. I should not have been at a loss for high-flown language with which to grace my narrative had I made it my design to regard anything else than what, as being strictly trustworthy, becomes my work. For among the very first remedies mentioned, we find those said to be derived from the ashes and nest of the phoenix, as though, forsooth, its existence were a well-ascertained fact, and not altogether a fable. And then besides, it would be a mere mockery to describe remedies that can only return to us once in a thousand years. The ancient Romans attributed to wool a degree of religious importance even, and it was in this spirit that they enjoined that the bride should touch the doorposts of her husband's house with wool. In addition to dress and protection from the cold, wool, in an unwashed state, used in combination with oil and wine or vinegar, supplies us with numerous remedies, according as we stand in need of an emollient 
or an excitant, an astringent, or a laxative. Wetted from time to time with these liquids, greasy wool is applied to sprained limbs and to sinews that are suffering from pain. In the case of sprains, some persons are in the habit of adding salt, while others, again, apply pounded rue and grease in wool. The same, too, in the case of contusions or tumors. Wool will improve the breath, it is said, if the teeth and gums are rubbed with it, mixed with honey. It is very good, too, for phrenitis, used as a fumigation. To arrest the bleeding of the nose, wool is introduced into the nostrils with oil of roses, or it is used in another manner, the ears being well plugged with it. In the case of inveterate ulcers, it is applied topically with honey. Soaked in wine or vinegar, or in cold water and oil, and then squeezed out, it is used for the cure of wounds. Ram's wool, washed in cold water and steeped in oil, is used for female complaints and to allay inflammations of the uterus. Proceedance of the uterus is reduced by using this wool in the form of a fumigation. Greasy wool, used as a plaster and as a pessary, brings away the dead fetus and arrests uterine discharges. Bites inflicted by a mad dog are plugged with unwashed wool, the application being removed at the end of seven days. Applied with cold water, it is a cure for agnails. Steeped in a mixture of boiling nitre, sulfur, oil, vinegar, and tar, and applied twice a day, as warm as possible, it allays pains in the loins. By making ligatures with unwashed ram's wool about the extremities of the limbs, bleeding is effectually stopped. In all cases, the wool most esteemed is that from the neck of the animal, the best kinds of wool being those of Galatia, Tarentum, Attica, and Miletus. For excoriations, blows, bruises, contusions, crushes, galls, falls, pains in the head and other parts, and for inflammation of the stomach, unwashed wool is applied with a mixture of vinegar and oil of roses. Reduced to ashes, it is applied to contusions, wounds, and burns, and forms an ingredient in ophthalmic compositions. It is employed also for fistulas and suppurations of the ears. For this last purpose, some persons take the wool as it is shorn, while others pluck it from the fleece. They then cut off the ends of it, and after drying and carding it, lay it in pots of unbaked earth, steep it well in honey, and burn it. Others again arrange it in layers alternately with chips of torch pine, and after sprinkling it with oil, set fire to it. They then rub the ashes into small vessels with the hands, and let them settle in water there. This operation is repeated and the water changed several times until at last the ashes are found to be slightly astringent without the slightest pungency, upon which they are put by for use, being possessed of certain caustic properties and extremely useful as a detergent for the eyelids. Chapter 10. 32 Remedies Derived from Wool Grease And not only this, but the filthy excretions even of sheep, the sweat adhering to the wool of the flanks and of the auxiliary concavities, a substance known as esopum, are applied to purposes almost innumerable, the grease produced by the sheep of Attica being the most highly esteemed. There are numerous ways of obtaining it, but the most approved method is to take the wool, fresh clipped from those parts of the body, or else the sweat and grease collected from any part of the fleece, and boil it gently in a copper vessel upon a slow fire. This done, it is left to cool, and the fat which floats upon the surface collected into an earthen vessel. The material originally used is then subjected to another boiling, and the two results are washed in cold water, after which they are strained through a linen cloth and exposed to the sun till they become bleached and quite transparent, and are then put by in a pewter box for keeping. The best proof of its genuineness is its retention of the strong smell of the original grease, and its not melting when rubbed with water upon the hand, but turning white like white lead in appearance. This substance is extremely useful for inflammations of the eyes and indurations of the eyelids. Some persons bake the wool in an earthen pot until it has lost all its grease and are of the opinion that, prepared this way, it is a more useful remedy for excoriations and indurations of the eyelids, for eruptions in the corners of the eyes, and for watery eyes. And not only does this grease heal ulcerations of the eyes, but, mixed with goose grease, of the ears and generative organs as well, in combination also with melilot and butter, it is a cure for inflammations of the uterus and for excoriations of the rectum and condylomata. The other uses to which it is applied we shall detail on a more appropriate occasion.
The grease, too, of the wool about the tail is made up into pills unmixed with any substance. These pills are dried and pulverized, being an excellent application for the teeth when loose even, and for the gums when attacked by spreading ulcers of cancerous nature. Sheep's wool, too, cleaned, is applied by itself, or with the addition of sulfur, for dull, heavy pains, and the ashes of it, burnt, are used for diseases of the generative organs. Indeed, this wool is possessed of such sovereign virtues that it is used as a covering for medicinal applications, even. It is also an especial remedy for the sheep itself, when it has lost its stomach and refuses to feed. For, upon plucking some wool from the tail, and then tying the tail therewith as tight as possible, the sheep will fall to feeding immediately. It is said, however, that the part of the tail which lies beyond the knot so made will quickly mortify and die. End of section 15. Read by Olivia. Section 16 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 16, Book 29, Chapters 11 through 25. Chapter 11, 22 Remedies Derived from Eggs. There is a considerable affinity also between wool and eggs, which are applied together as a frontal to the forehead by way of cure for deflections of the eyes. Wool, however, is not required for this purpose to have been dressed with radicula. The only thing requisite to be combined with it being the white of an egg and powdered frankincense. The white of an egg, also applied by itself, arrests deflections of the eyes and has a cooling effect upon inflammations of those organs. Some, however, prefer mixing saffron with it and employ it as an ingredient in eye salves in place of water. For ophthalmalia in infants, there is hardly any remedy to be found, except white of egg mixed with fresh butter. Eggs beaten up with oil are very soothing for erysipelas, beet leaves being laid on the liniment. White of egg mixed with pounded gum ammoniae is used as a bandolin for arranging the hairs of the eyelids, and in combination with pine nuts and a little honey, it forms a lineament for the removal of pimples on the face. If the face is well rubbed with it, it will never be sunburned. If the moment the flesh has been scalded and egg is applied, no blisters will form. Some persons, however, mix it with barley meal and a little salt. In cases of ulceration formed by burns, there is nothing better than parched barley and hog's lard mixed with the white of an egg. The same mixture is also used as an application for diseases of the rectum, in infants even, and in cases too, when there is procedence of those parts. For the cure of chaps upon the feet, white of eggs is boiled, with two denarii of white lead, an equal quantity of litharge, a little myrrh, and some wine. For the cure of erysipelas, they use the whites of three eggs with a mylum. It is said, too, that the white of egg has the effect of knitting wounds and of expelling urinary calculi. The yolk of eggs boiled hard, applied in women's milk with a little saffron and honey, has a soothing effect upon pains in the eyes. The yolk is applied also to the eyes in wool, mixed with honeyed wine and oil of roses, or else mixed with ground parsley seed and polenta and applied with honeyed wine. The yolk of a single egg, swallowed raw by itself, without being allowed to touch the teeth, is remarkably good for cough deflections of the chest, and irritations of the fauces. It is used, too, both internally and externally, in a raw state, as a sovereign cure for the sting of hemorrhoids, and it is highly beneficial for the kidneys, for irritations and ulcerations of the bladder, and for bloody expectorations. For dysentery, the yolks of five eggs are taken raw in one semi-sectarius of wine, mixed with the ashes of the shells, poppy juice, and wine. For the coliac fluxes, it is recommended to take the yolks of eggs with like proportions of pulpy raisins and pomegranate rind in equal quantities for three consecutive days, or else to follow another method and take the yolks of three eggs with three ounces of old bacon and honey and three saiethi of old wine, the whole being beaten up to the consistency of honey and taken in water, 
when needed, in pieces the size of a hazelnut. In some cases, too, the yolks of three eggs are fried in oil, the whole of the egg having been steeped a day previously in vinegar. It is in this way that eggs are used for the treatment of spleen diseases, but for spitting of blood, they should be taken with three cyathi of must. Yolk of egg is used, too, for the cure of bruises of long standing, in combination with bulbs and honey. Boiled and taken in wine, yolks of eggs arrest menstruation. Applied raw with oil or wine, they dispel inflammations of the uterus. Mixed with goose grease and oil of roses, they are useful for crick in the neck, and they are hardened over the fire and applied warm for the cure of maladies of the rectum. For condylomata, eggs are used in combination with oil of roses, and for the treatment of burns, they are hardened in water and set upon hot coals till the shells are burnt, the yellow being used as a lineament with oil of roses. Eggs become entirely transformed into yolk on being removed after the hen has sat upon them for three days, in which state they are known by the name of sitista. The chicks that are found within the shell are used for strengthening a disordered stomach, being eaten with half a nut gall, and no other food taken for the next two hours. They are given also for dysentery, boiled in the egg with one semi sextarius of astringent wine, and an equal quantity of olive oil and polenta. The pellicule that lines the shell is used, either raw or boiled, for the cure of cracked lips, and the shell itself, reduced to ashes, is taken in wine for discharges of blood. Care must be taken, however, to burn it without the pellicule. In the same way, too, a dentifrice is prepared. The ashes of the shell, applied topically with myrrh, arrest menstruation when in excess. So remarkably strong is the shell of an egg, that if it is set upright, no force or weight can break it, unless a slight inclination be made to one side or the other of the circumference. Eggs taken whole in wine, with rue, dill, and cumin, facilitate parturition. Used with wine and cedar resin, they remove itch and prurigo, and applied in combination with cyclaminos, they are remedial for running ulcers of the head. For purulent expectorations and spitting of blood, a raw egg is taken, warmed with juice of cut leek, and an equal quantity of Greek honey. For coughs, eggs are administered, boiled and beaten up with honey, or else raw, with raisin wine and an equal quantity of olive oil. For diseases of the male organs, an injection is made of an egg, three cyathi of raisin wine, and half an ounce of amylum, the mixture being used immediately after the bath. Where injuries have been inflicted by serpents, boiled eggs are used as a lineament, beaten up with nasturtium. In what various ways eggs are used as food is well known to all, passing downwards, however swollen the throat may be, and warming the parts as they pass. Eggs, too, are the only diet which, while it affords nutriment and sickness, does not load the stomach, possessing at the same moment all the advantages both of food and drink. We have already stated that the shell of an egg becomes soft when steeped in vinegar. It is by the aid of eggs thus prepared, and kneaded up with meal into bread, that patients suffering from coliac flux are often restored to strength. Some, however, think it a better plan to roast the eggs when thus softened in a shallow pan, a method by the aid of which they arrest not only looseness of bowels, but excessive menstruation as well. In cases, again, where the discharges are greatly in excess, eggs are taken raw with meal and water. The yolks, too, are employed alone, boiled hard in vinegar and roasted with ground pepper when wanted to arrest diarrhea. For dysentery, there is a sovereign remedy, prepared in the following manner. An egg is emptied into a new earthen vessel, which done, in order that all the proportions may be equal, fill the shell, first with honey, then with oil, and then with vinegar. Beat them up together, and thoroughly incorporate them. The better the quality of the several ingredients, the more efficacious the mixture will be. Others, again, instead of oil and vinegar, use the same proportions of red resin and wine. There is also another way of making up this preparation. The proportion of oil, and of that only, remains the same, and to it they add two sixtieth parts of a denarius of the vegetable, which we have spoken of under the name of ruse, and five oboli of honey. 
All these ingredients are boiled down together, and no food is taken by the patient till the end of four hours after taking the mixture. Many persons, too, have a cure for gripping pains of the bowels by beating up two eggs with four cloves of garlic and administering them warmed in one semi-sextarius of wine. Not to omit anything in commendation of eggs. I would here add that glare of egg mixed with quicklime unites broken glass. Indeed, so great is the efficacy of the substance of egg that wood dipped in it will not take fire, and cloth with which it has come in contact will not ignite. On this occasion, however, it is only of the eggs of poultry that I have been speaking, though those of the various other birds, as well, are possessed of many useful properties, as I shall have to mention on the appropriate occasions. Chapter 12. Serpent's Eggs in addition to the above, there is another kind of egg, held in high renown by the people of the Gaelic provinces, but totally omitted by the Greek writers. In summer time, numberless snakes become artificially entwined together, and form rings around their bodies, with the viscous slime which exudes from their mouths, and with the foam excreted by them. The name given to this substance is anguinum. The druids tell us that the serpents eject these eggs into the air by their hissing, and that a person must be ready to catch them in a cloak, so as not to let them touch the ground. They say also that he must instantly take to flight on horseback, as the serpents will be sure to pursue him, until some intervening river has placed a barrier between them. The test of its genuineness, they say, is its floating against the current of a stream, even though it be set in gold. But as it is the way with magicians to be dexterous and cunning in casting a veil about their frauds, they pretend that these eggs can only be taken on a certain day of the moon, as though, forsooth, it depended entirely upon the human will to make the moon and the serpents accord as to the moment of this operation. I myself, however, have seen one of these eggs. It was round and about as large as an apple of moderate size. The shell of it was formed of a cartilaginous substance, and it was surrounded with numerous cupules, as it were, resembling those upon the arms of Polypus. It is held in high estimation among the Druids. The possession of it is marvelously vaunted as ensuring success in lawsuits and a favorable reception with princes, a notion which has been so far belied that a Roman of equestrian rank, a native of the territory of the Vocantii, who, during a trial, had one of these eggs in his bosom, was slain by the late emperor Tiberius, and for no other reason that I know of, but because he was in possession of it. It is this entwining of serpents with one another, and the fruitful result of this unison, that seemed to me to have given rise to the usage, among foreign nations, of surrounding the caduceus with representations of serpents, as so many symbols of peace, it must be remembered, too, that on the caduceus, serpents are never represented as having crests. Chapter 13. The Method of Preparing Comaginum. Four Remedies Derived From It. Having to make mention, in the present book, of the eggs of the goose and the numerous uses to which they are applied, as also of the bird itself, it is our duty to award the honor to comagini of a most celebrated preparation there made, this composition is prepared from goose grease, a substance applied to many other well-known uses as well. But in the case of that, which comes from Comagini, a part of Syria, the grease is first incorporated with cinnamon, cassia, white pepper, and the plant called Comagini, and then placed in vessels and buried in the snow. The mixture has an agreeable smell, and it is found extremely useful for cold shiverings, convulsions, heavy or sudden pains, and all those affections, in fact, which are treated with a class of remedies known as a copa, being equally an unguent and a medicament. There is another method also of preparing it in Syria. The fat of the bird is preserved in a manner already described, and there is added to it erysoskeptrum, xylobalsamum, palm elate, and calamus, each in the same proportion as the grease, the whole being gently boiled some two or three times in wine. This preparation is made in winter, as in summer it will never thicken, except with the addition of wax. There are numerous other remedies also, derived from the goose, as well as from the raven, a thing I am much surprised at, 
seeing that both the goose and the raven are generally said to be in a diseased state at the end of summer and the beginning of autumn. Chapter 14. Remedies Derived from the Dog we have already spoken of the honors earned by the geese when the Gauls were detected in their attempt to scale the capital. It is for a corresponding reason, also, that punishment is yearly inflicted upon the dogs by crucifying them alive upon a gibbet of elder between the temple of Juventus and that of Sumanus. In reference to this last-mentioned animal, the usages of our forefathers compel us to enter into some further details. They consider the flesh of sucking whelps, to be so pure a meat, that they were in the habit of using them as victims even in their expiatory sacrifices. A young whelp, too, is sacrificed to genita mana, and at the repast, celebrated in honor of the gods, it is still the usage to set whelp's flesh on table. At the inaugural feast, too, of the pontiffs, this dish was in common use, as we learn from the comedies of Plautus. It is generally thought that for narcotic poisons, there is nothing better than dog's blood, and it would appear that it was this animal that first taught man the use of emetics. Other medicinal uses of the dog, which are marvelously commended, I shall have occasion to refer to on the appropriate occasions. Chapter 15. Remedies classified according to the different maladies. Remedies for injuries inflicted by serpents. Remedies derived from mice. We now resume the order originally proposed. For stings inflicted by serpents, fresh sheep's dung, boiled in wine, is considered a very useful application, as also mice split asunder and applied to the wound. Indeed, these last animals are possessed of certain properties, by no means to be despised, at the ascension of the planets more particularly, as already stated the lobes increasing or decreasing in number with the age of the moon, as the case may be. The magicians have a story that swine will follow any person who gives them a mouse's liver to eat, enclosed in a fig. They say, too, that it has a similar effect upon man, but that the spell may be destroyed by swallowing a cyathus of oil. Chapter 16. Remedies Derived from the Weasel There are two varieties of the weasel, the one, wild, larger than the other, and known to the Greeks as the ictus. Its gall is said to be very efficacious as an antidote to the sting of the asp, but of a venomous nature in other respects. The other kind, which prowls about our houses, and is in the habit, Cicero tells us, of removing its young ones and changing every day from place to place, is an enemy to serpents. The flesh of this last, preserved in salt, is given, in doses of one denarius, in three cyathi of drink, to persons who have been stung by serpents, or else the maw of the animal is stuffed with coriander seed and dried, to be taken for the same purpose in wine. The young one of the weasel is still more efficacious for these purposes. Chapter 17. Remedies Derived from Bugs there are some things of a most revolting nature, but which are recommended by authors with such a degree of assurance that it would be improper to omit them, the more particularly as it is, to the sympathy or antipathy of objects that remedies owe their existence. Thus the bug, for instance, a most filthy insect, and one the very name of which inspires us with loathing, is said to be a neutralizer of the venom of serpents, asps in particular, and to be a preservative against all kinds of poisons. As a proof of this, they tell us that the sting of an asp is never fatal to poultry if they have eaten bugs that day, and that, if such is the case, their flesh is remarkably beneficial to persons who have been stung by serpents. Of the various recipes given in reference to these insects, the least revolting are the application of them externally to the wound with the blood of a tortoise, the employment of them as a fumigation to make leeches loose their hold, and the administering of them to animals in drink when a leech has been accidentally swallowed. Some persons, however, go so far as to crush bugs with salt and woman's milk, and anoint the eyes with the mixture. In combination, too, with honey and oil of roses, they use them as an injection for the ears. Field bugs again, and those found upon the mallow, are burnt, and the ashes mixed with oil of roses as an injection for the ears. As to the other remedial virtues attributed to bugs, 
for the cure of vomiting, quartan fevers, and other diseases, although we find recommendations given to swallow them in an egg, some wax, or in a bean. I look upon them as utterly unfounded, and not worthy of further notice. They are employed, however, for the treatment of lethargy, and with some fair reason, as they successfully neutralize the narcotic effects of the poison of the asp. For this purpose, seven of them are administered in a cyathus of water, but in the case of children, only four. In cases, too, of strangury, they have been injected into the urinary channel. So true it is that nature, that universal parent, has engendered nothing without some powerful reason or other. In addition to these particulars, a couple of bugs, it is said, attached to the left arm in some wool that has been stolen from the shepherds, will effectually cure nocturnal fevers, while those recurrent in the daytime may be treated with equal success by enclosing the bugs in a piece of russet-colored cloth. The scolopendra, on the other hand, is a great enemy to these insects. Used in the form of a fumigation, it kills them. Chapter 18. Particulars Relative to the Asp The sting of the asp takes deadly effect by causing torpor and dizziness. Of all serpents, injuries inflicted by the asp are the most incurable, and their venom, if it comes in contact with the blood or a recent wound, produces instantaneous death. If, on the other hand, it touches an old sore, its fatal effects are not so immediate. Taken internally, in however large a quantity, the venom is not injurious, as it has no corrosive properties, for which reason it is that the flesh of animals killed by it may be eaten with impunity. I should hesitate in giving circulation to a prescription for injuries inflicted by the asp, were it not that Marcus Varro, then in the 83rd year of his age, has left a statement to the effect that it is a most efficient remedy for wounds inflicted by this reptile for the person stung to drink his own urine. Chapter 19. Remedies Derived from the Basilisk As to the basilisk, a creature which the very serpents fly from, which kills by its odor even, and which proves fatal to man by only looking upon him, its blood has been marvelously extolled by magicians. This blood is thick and adhesive, like pitch, which it resembles also in color. Dissolved in water, they say, it becomes a brighter red than that of cinnabar. They attribute to it also the property of ensuring success to petitions, preferred to potentates, and to prayers even offered to the gods and they regard it as a remedy for various diseases, and as an amulet preservative against all noxious spells. Some give it the name of Saturn's blood. Chapter 20. Remedies Derived from the Dragon The dragon is a serpent, destitute of venom, its head placed beneath the threshold of a door, the gods being duly propitiated by prayers, will ensure good fortune to the house, it is said. Its eyes, dried and beaten up with honey, form a lineament which is an effectual preservative against the terrors of specters by night, in the case of the most timorous even, the fat adhering to the heart, attached to the arm with a deer's sinews, in the skin of a gazelle, will ensure success in lawsuits, it is said, and the first joint of the vertebrae will secure an easy access to persons in high office. The teeth, attached to the body, with a deer's sinews in the skin of a roebuck, have the effect of rendering masters indulgent, and potentates gracious, it is said. But the most remarkable thing of all is its composition, by the aid of which the lying magicians profess to render persons invincible. They take the tail and head of a dragon, the hairs of a lion's forehead, with the marrow of that animal, the foam of a horse that has won a race, and the claws of a dog's feet, these they tie up together in a deer's skin, and fasten them alternately with the sinews of a deer and a gazelle. It is, however, no better worth our while to refute such pretensions as these than it would be to describe the alleged remedies for injuries inflicted by serpents, seeing that all these contrivances are so many evil devices to poison men's morals. Dragon's fat will repel venomous creatures, an effect which is equally produced by burning the fat of the ichneumon. They will take to flight also at the approach of a person who has been rubbed with nettles, bruised in vinegar. Chapter 21. Remedies Derived from the Viper The application of viper's head, even if it be not the one that has inflicted the wound, 
is of infinite utility as a remedy. It is highly advantageous to, to hold the viper that inflicted the injury on the end of a stick over the steam of boiling water, for it will quite undo the mischief they say. The ashes also of the viper are considered very useful, employed as a lineament for the wound. According to what Nagidius tells us, serpents are compelled, by a certain natural instinct, to return to the person who has been stung by them. The people of Scythia split the viper's head between the ears, in order to extract a small stone, which it swallows in its alarm, they say. Others, again, use the head entire. From the viper are prepared those tablets, which are known as theriaci to the Greeks. For this purpose, the animal is cut away three fingers' lengths from both the head and the tail, after which the intestines are removed, and the livid vein adhering to the backbone. The rest of the body is then boiled in a shallow pan, in water seasoned with dill, and the bones are taken out, and fine wheaten flour added, after which the preparation is made up into tablets, which are dried in the shade, and are employed as an ingredient in numerous medicaments. I should remark, however, that this preparation, it would appear, can only be made from the viper. Some persons, after cleansing the viper in manner above described, boil down the fat with one sectarius of olive oil to one half. Of this preparation, when needed, three drops are added to some oil, with which mixture the body is rubbed to repel the approach of all kinds of noxious animals. Chapter 22 remedies derived from the other serpents. In addition to these particulars, it is a well-known fact that for all injuries inflicted by serpents, and those even of an otherwise incurable nature, it is an excellent remedy to apply the entrails of the serpent itself to the wound, as also that persons who have once swallowed a viper's liver, boiled, will never afterwards be attacked by serpents. The snake, too, is not venomous, except, indeed, upon certain days of the month when it is irritated by the action of the moon. It is a very useful plan to take it alive and pound it in water, the wound inflicted by it being fomented with the preparation. Indeed, it is generally supposed that this reptile is possessed of numerous other remedial properties, as we shall have occasion more fully to mention from time to time. Hence it is that the snake is consecrated to Aesculapius. As for Democritus, he has given some monstrous preparations from snakes, by the aid of which the language of birds, he says, may be understood. The Aesculapian snake was first brought to Rome from Epidaurus, but at the present day it is very commonly reared in our houses even, so much so, indeed, that if the breed were not taken down by the frequent conflagrations, it would be impossible to make head against the rapid increase of them. But the most beautiful of all the snakes are those which are of an amphibious nature. These snakes are known as hydri, or water snakes. In virulence, their venom is inferior to that of no other class of serpents, and their liver is preserved as a remedy for the ill effects of their sting. A pounded scorpion neutralizes the venom of the spotted lizard. From this last animal, too, there is a noxious preparation made, for it has been found that wine in which it has been drowned covers the face of those who drinks it with morphew. Hence it is that females, when jealous of a rival's beauty, are in the habit of stifling a spotted lizard in the unguents which they made. In such a case, the proper remedy is a yolk of egg, honey, and nitre. The gall of a spotted lizard, beaten up in water, attracts weasels, they say. Chapter 23. Remedies Derived from the Salamander But of all venomous animals, it is the salamander that is by far the most dangerous. For while other reptiles attack individuals only, and never kill many persons at a time, not to mention the fact that after stinging a human being, they are said to die of remorse, and the earth refuses to harbor them. The salamander is able to destroy whole nations at once, unless they take the proper precautions against it. For if this reptile happens to crawl up a tree, it infects all the fruit with its poison, and kills those who eat thereof, by the chilling properties of its venom, which in its effects is in no way different from aconite. Nay, even more than this, if it only touches with its foot the wood upon which bread is baked, or if it happens to fall into a well, the same fatal effects will be sure to ensue. 
the saliva too of this reptile if it comes in contact with any part of the body the sole of the foot even will cause the hair to fall off from the whole of the body and yet the salamander highly venomous as it is is eaten by certain animals swine for example owing no doubt to that antipathy which prevails in the natural world from what we have stated it is most probable that next to the animals which eat it the best neutralizers of the poison of this reptile are cantharides taken in drink or a lizard eaten with the food other antidotes we have already mentioned or shall notice in the proper place as to what the magicians say that it is proof against fire being as they tell us the only animal that has the property of extinguishing fire if it had been true it would have been made trial of at rome long before this sextius says that the salamander preserved in honey and taken with the food after removing the intestines head and feet acts as an aphrodisiac he denies also that it has the property of extinguishing fire chapter twenty four remedies derived from birds for injuries inflicted by serpents remedies derived from the vulture among the birds that afford us remedies against serpents it is the vulture that occupies the highest rank the black vulture it has been remarked being less efficacious than the others the smell of their feathers burnt will repel serpents they say and it has been asserted that persons that carry the heart of this bird about with them will be safe not only from serpents but from wild beasts as well and will have nothing to fear from the attacks of robbers or from the wrath of kings chapter twenty five remedies derived from poultry the flesh of cocks and capons applied warm the moment it has been plucked from the bones neutralizes the venom of serpents and the brains taken in wine are productive of a similar effect the people of parthia however prefer applying a hen's brains to the wound poultry broth too is highly celebrated as a cure and is found marvelously useful in many other cases panthers and lions will never touch persons who have been rubbed with it more particularly if it has been flavored with garlic the broth that has been made of an old cock is more relaxing to the bowels it is very good also for chronic fevers numbness of the limbs cold shiverings and maladies of the joints pains also in the head defluxions of the eyes flatulency sickness at stomach incipient tenesmus liver complaints diseases of the kidneys affections of the bladder indigestion and asthma hence there are several remedies for preparing this broth it being most efficacious when boiled up with sea cabbage salt tunny capers parsley the plant mercurialis polypodium or dill the best plan however is to boil the cock or capon with the plants above mentioned in three congii of water down to three semi sectarii after which it should be left to cool in the open air and given at the proper moment just after an emetic has been administered and here i must not omit to mention one marvelous fact even though it bears no reference to medicine if the flesh of poultry is mingled with gold in a state of fusion it will absorb the metal and consume it thus showing that it acts as a poison upon gold if young twigs are made up into a collar and put around a cock's neck it will never crow End of section 16. Section 17 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Natural History, Volume 6 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 17, Book 29, Chapters 26 to 39. Chapter 26, Remedies Derived from Other Birds. The flesh of pigeons also, or of swallows, used fresh and minced, is a remedy for injuries inflicted by serpents. The same, too, with the feet of a horned owl, burnt with the plant plumbago. While mentioning this bird, too, I must not forget to cite another instance of the impositions practised by the magicians. Among other prodigious lies of theirs, they pretend that the heart of a horned owl 
applied to the left breast of a woman while asleep, will make her disclose all her secret thoughts. They say also, in addition to this, that persons who have it about them in battle will be sure to display valour. They describe, too, certain remedies made from the egg of this bird for the hair. But who, pray, has ever had the opportunity of seeing the egg of a horned owl, considering that it is so highly ominous to see the bird itself? And then, besides, who has ever thought proper to make the experiment, and upon his hair more particularly? In addition to all this, the magicians go so far as to engage to make the hair curl by using the blood of the young of the horned owl. What they tell us, too, about the bat appears to belong to pretty much the same class of stories. If one of these animals is carried alive three times round a house, they say, and then nailed outside of the window with the head downwards, it will have all the effects of a counter charm. They assert also that the bat is a most excellent preservative for sheep folds, being first carried three times round them, and then hung up by the foot over the lintel of the door. The blood of the bat is also recommended by them as a sovereign remedy, in combination with a thistle, for injuries inflicted by serpents. Chapter 27. Remedies for the Bite of the Phalangium The Several Varieties of that Insect and of the Spider Of the Phalangium, an insect unknown to Italy, there are numerous kinds one of which resembles the ant, but is much larger, with a red head, black as to the other parts of the body, and covered with white spots. Its sting is much more acute than that of the wasp, and it lives mostly in the vicinity of ovens and mills. The proper remedy is to present before the eyes of the person stung another insect of the same description, a purpose for which they are preserved when found dead. Their husks, also, found in a dry state, are beaten up and taken in drink for a similar purpose. The young of the weasel, too, as already stated, are possessed of a similar property. The Greeks give the name of phalangion also to a kind of spider, but they generally distinguish it by the surname of the wolf. A third kind, also known as the phalangium, is a spider with a hairy body and a head of enormous size. When opened, there are found in it two small worms, they say, these attached in a piece of deer's skin before sunrise to a woman's body, will prevent conception, according to what Cecilius in his commentaries says. This property lasts, however, for a year only, and indeed it is the only one of all the anticonceptives that I feel myself at liberty to mention in favour of some women whose fecundity, quite teeming with children, stands in need of some such respite. There is another kind, again, called ragion, similar to a black grape in appearance, with a very diminutive mouth, situate beneath the abdomen, and extremely short legs, which have all the appearance of not being fully developed. The bite of this last insect causes fully as much pain as the sting of the scorpion, and the urine of persons who are injured by it presents filmy appearances like cobwebs. The asterion would be identical with it were it not distinguished by white streaks upon the body. Its bite causes failing in the knees. But worse than either of these last is a blue spider covered with black hair, and causing dimness of the sight and vomiting of a matter like cobwebs in appearance. A still more dangerous kind is one which differs only from the hornet in form in being destitute of wings, and the bite of which causes a wasting away of the system. The myrmecion in the head resembles the ant, has a black body spotted with white, and causes by its bite a pain like that attendant upon the sting of the wasp. Of the tetra gnathius, there are two varieties, the more noxious of which has two white streaks crossing each other on the middle of the head. Its bite causes the mouth to swell. The other one is of an ashy colour 
whitish on the posterior part of the body, and not so ready to bite. The least noxious of all is the spider that is seen extending its web along the walls and lying in wait for flies. It is of the same ashy colour as the last. For the bite of all spiders, the best remedies are a cock's brains taken in oxycrate with a little pepper, five ants swallowed in drink, sheep's dung applied in vinegar, and spiders of any kind left to putrefy in oil. The bite of the shrew mouse is cured by taking lamb's rennet in wine, the ashes of a ram's foot with honey, or a young weasel prepared in manner already mentioned by us when speaking of serpents. In cases where a shrew mouse has bitten beasts of burden, a mouse fresh caught is applied to the wound with oil, or a bat's gall with vinegar. The shrew mouse itself, too, split asunder and applied to the wound, is a cure for its bite. Indeed, if the animal is with young when the injury is inflicted, it will instantly burst asunder. The best plan is to apply the mouse itself which has inflicted the bite, but others are commonly kept for this purpose, either steeped in oil or coated with clay. Another remedy again for its bite is the earth taken from the rut made by a cartwheel. For this animal, it is said, owing to a certain torpor which is natural to it, will never cross a rut made by a wheel. Chapter 28. Remedies derived from the stelio or spotted lizard. The stelio, in its turn, is said to have the greatest antipathy to the scorpion, so much so indeed that the very sight of it strikes terror in that reptile and a torpor attended with cold sweats. Hence it is that this lizard is left to putrefy in oil as a liniment for injuries inflicted by the scorpion. Some persons boil down the oil with litharge and make a sort of plaster of it to apply to the wound. The Greeks give the name of colotes to this lizard, as also ascalabotis and galiotis. It is never found in Italy and is covered with small spots, utters a shrill piercing noise and lives on food. Characteristics, all of them, foreign to the stelio of Italy. Chapter 29. Remedies derived from various insects. Poultry dung, too, is good as an application for the sting of the scorpion, a dragon's liver also, a lizard or mouse split asunder, or else the scorpion itself, either applied to the wound, grilled and eaten, or taken in two sciathi of undiluted wine. One peculiarity of the scorpion is that it never stings the palm of the hand and never touches any parts of the body but those covered with hair. Any kind of pebble applied to the wound on the side which has lain next to the ground will alleviate the pain. A potsherd, too, covered with earth on any part of it and applied just as it is found will effect a cure, it is said. The person, however, who applies it must not look behind him and must be equally careful that the sun does not shine upon him. Earthworms also are pounded and applied to the wound, in addition to which they form ingredients in numerous other medicaments, being kept in honey for the purpose. For injuries inflicted by bees, wasps, hornets and leeches, the owlet is considered a very useful remedy. Persons, too, who carry about them the beak of the woodpecker of Mars are never injured by any of these creatures. The smaller kinds of locusts also, destitute of wings and known as a telebee, are a good remedy for the sting of the scorpion. There is a kind of venomous ant, by no means common in Italy. Cicero calls it solipuga and in Betica it is known as salpuga. The proper remedy for its venom, and that of all kinds of ants, is a bat's heart. We have already stated that cantharides are an antidote to the salamander. Chapter 30. Remedies derived from cantharides. But with reference to cantharides, 
there has been considerable controversy on the subject, seeing that, taken internally, they are a poison, attended with excruciating pains in the bladder. Cosinus, a Roman of the equestrian order, well known for his intimate friendship with the Emperor Nero, being attacked with lichen, that prince sent to Egypt for a physician to cure him, who, recommending a potion prepared from Cantharides, the patient was killed in consequence. There is no doubt, however, that, applied externally, they are useful, in combination with juice of Taminian grapes and the suet of a sheep or she-goat. As to the part of the body in which the poison of the insect is situate, authors are by no means agreed. Some fancy that it exists in the feet and head, while others again deny it. Indeed, the only point that has been well ascertained is that the wings are the only antidote to their venom, wherever it may be situate. Cantharides are produced from a small grub, found more particularly in the spongy excrescences which grow on the stem of the dog rose, and still more abundantly upon the ash. Other kinds again are found upon the white rose, but they are by no means so efficacious. The most active of all in their properties are those which are spotted with yellow streaks running transversely across the wings, and are plump and well filled. Those which are small, broad and hairy are not so powerful in their operation, and the least useful of all are those which are thin and shriveled and present one uniform colour. They are put in a small earthen pot, not coated with pitch, and stopped at the mouth with a linen cloth, a layer of full-blown roses being placed upon them. They are then suspended over vinegar boiled with salt, until the steam has penetrated the cloth and stifled them, after which they are put by for use. They have a caustic effect upon the skin, and cover the ulcerations with a crust, a property which belongs also to the pine caterpillar found upon the pitch tree, and to the bupestris, both of which are prepared in a similar manner. All these insects are extremely efficacious for the cure of leprosy and lichens. It is said, too, that they act as an ememagogue and diuretic, for which last reason Hippocrates used to prescribe them for dropsy. Cato of Utica was reproached with selling poison because when disposing of a royal property by auction, he sold a quantity of cantharides at the price of 60,000 sesterces. We may here remark, too, that it was on the same occasion that some ostrich fat was sold at the price of 30,000 sesterces, a substance which is preferable to goose grease in every respect. Chapter 31. Various Counter Poisons We have already spoken of various kinds of poisonous honey. The antidote employed for it is honey in which the bees have been stifled. This honey, too, taken in wine, is a remedy for indispositions caused by eating fish. Chapter 32. Remedies for the Bite of the Mad Dog When a person has been bitten by a mad dog, he may be preserved from hydrophobia by applying the ashes of a dog's head to the wound. All ashes of this description, we may here remark once for all, are prepared in the same method the substance being placed in a new earthen vessel well covered with potter's clay and put into a furnace. These ashes, too, are very good taken in drink, and hence some recommend the head itself to be eaten in such cases. Others again attach to the body of the patient a maggot taken from the carcass of a dead dog, or else place the menstruous blood of a bitch in a linen cloth beneath his cup, or insert in the wound ashes of hairs from the tail of the dog that inflicted the bite. Dogs will fly from anyone who has a dog's heart about him, and they will never bark at a person who carries a dog's tongue in his shoe, beneath the great toe, or the tail of a weasel which has been set at liberty 
after being deprived of it. There is beneath the tongue of a mad dog a certain slimy spittle, which, taken in drink, is a preventative of hydrophobia. But much the most useful plan is to take the liver of the dog that has inflicted the injury and eat it raw, if possible. Should that not be the case, it must be cooked in some way or other, or else a broth must be taken, prepared from the flesh. There is a small worm in a dog's tongue, known as litta to the Greeks. If this is removed from the animal while a pup, it will never become mad or lose its appetite. This worm, after being carried thrice round a fire, is given to persons who have been bitten by a mad dog to prevent them from becoming mad. This madness, too, is prevented by eating a cock's brains. But the virtue of these brains lasts for one year only and no more. They say, too, that a cock's comb, pounded, is highly efficacious as an application to the wound, as also goose grease mixed with honey. The flesh, also, of a mad dog is sometimes salted and taken with the food as a remedy for this disease. In addition to this, young puppies of the same sex as the dog that has inflicted the injury are drowned in water, and the person who has been bitten eats their liver raw. The dung of poultry, provided it is of a red colour, is very useful, applied with vinegar. The ashes, too, of the tail of a shrew mouse, if the animal has survived and been set at liberty. A clod from a swallow's nest, applied with vinegar. The young of a swallow, reduced to ashes. Or the skin or old slough of a serpent that has been cast in spring, beaten up with a male crab in wine. This slough, I would remark, put away by itself in chests and drawers, destroys moths. So virulent is the poison of the mad dog that its very urine, even if trodden upon, is injurious, more particularly if the person has any ulcerous sores about him. The proper remedy in such case is to apply horse dung, sprinkled with vinegar, and warmed in a fig. These marvellous properties of the poison will occasion the less surprise when we remember that a stone bitten by a dog has become a proverbial expression for discord and variance. Whoever makes water where a dog has previously watered will be sensible of numbness in the loins, they say. The lizard, known by some persons as the seps and by others as the calcidice, taken in wine, is a cure for its own bite. Chapter 33. Remedies for the Other Poisons Where persons have been poisoned by noxious preparations from the wild weasel, the proper remedy is the broth of an old cock, taken in considerable quantities. This broth, too, is particularly good, taken as a counter-poison for aconite, in combination with a little salt. Poultry dung, but the white part only, boiled with hyssop, or with honeyed wine, is an excellent antidote to the poison of fungi and of mushrooms. It is a cure also for flatulency and suffocations, a thing the more to be wondered at, seeing that if any other living creature only tastes this dung, it is immediately attacked with gripping pains and flatulency. Goose blood, taken with an equal quantity of olive oil, is an excellent neutralizer of the venom of the sea hare. It is kept also as an antidote for all kinds of noxious drugs, made up into lozenges with red earth and lemnos, and juice of white thorn, five drachmae of the lozenges being taken in three syathi of water. The same property belongs also to the young of the weasel, prepared in manner already mentioned. Lamb's rennet is an excellent antidote to all noxious preparations, the blood also of ducks from Pontus, for which reason it is preserved in a dry state and dissolved in wine when wanted, some persons being of opinion that the blood of the female bird is the most efficacious. In a similar manner, the crop of a stork 
acts as a universal counterpoison, and so does sheep's rennet. A broth made from ram's flesh is particularly good as a remedy for cantharides. Sheep's milk also taken warm. This last being very useful in cases where persons have drunk an infusion of aconite or have swallowed the buprestis in drink. The dung of wood pigeons is particularly good taken internally as an antidote to quicksilver. And for narcotic poisons, the common weasel is kept dried and taken internally in doses of two drachmae. Chapter 34 Remedies for Alopecia Where the hair has been lost through alopecia, it is made to grow again by using ashes of burnt sheep's dung with oil of cypress and honey, or else the hoof of a mule of either sex burnt to ashes and mixed with oil of myrtle. In addition to these substances, we find our own writer, Varro, mentioning mouse dung, which he calls muscerda, and the heads of flies applied fresh, the part being first rubbed with a fig leaf. Some recommend the blood of flies, while others again apply ashes of burnt flies for ten days, in the proportion of one part of the ashes to two of ashes of papyrus or of nuts. In other cases again, we find ashes of burnt flies kneaded up with women's milk and cabbage, or in some instances with honey only. It is generally believed that there is no creature less docile or less intelligent than the fly, a circumstance which makes it all the more marvellous that at the sacred games at Olympia, immediately after the immolation of the bull in honour of the god called Myiades, whole clouds of them take their departure from that territory. A mouse's head or tail, or indeed the whole of the body, reduced to ashes, is a cure for alopecia, more particularly when the loss of the hair has been the result of some noxious preparation. The ashes of a hedgehog mixed with honey, or of its skin applied with tar, are productive of a similar effect. The head too of this last animal, reduced to ashes, restores the hair to scars upon the body, the place being first prepared, when this cure is made use of, with a razor and an application of mustard. Some persons, however, prefer vinegar for the purpose. All the properties attributed to the hedgehog are found in the porcupine in a still higher degree. A lizard, burnt, as already mentioned, with the fresh root of a reed cut as fine as possible, to facilitate its being reduced to ashes, and then mixed with oil of myrtle, will prevent the hair from coming off. For all these purposes, green lizards are still more efficacious, and the remedy is rendered most effectual when salt is added, bear's grease, and pounded onions. Some persons boil ten green lizards in ten sextari of oil, and content themselves with rubbing the place with the mixture once a month. Alopecia is also cured very speedily with the ashes of a viper's skin, or by an application of fresh poultry dung. A raven's egg, beaten up in a copper vessel and applied to the head, previously shaved, imparts a black colour to the hair. Care must be taken, however, to keep some oil in the mouth till the application is quite dry, or else the teeth will turn black as well. The operation must be performed also in the shade, and the liniment must not be washed off before the end of three days. Some persons employ the blood and brains of a raven in combination with red wine, while others again boil down the bird and put it at bedtime in a vessel made of lead. With some it is the practice, for the cure of alopecia, to apply bruised cantharides with tar, the skin being first prepared with an application of nitre. It should be remembered, however, that cantharides are possessed of caustic properties, and due care must be taken not to let them eat too deep into the skin. 
For the ulcerations thus produced, it is recommended to use applications made of the heads, gall and dung of mice, mixed with hellebore and pepper. Chapter 35. Remedies for lice and for porigo. Nits are destroyed by using dog's fat, eating serpents cooked like eels, or else taking their sloughs in drink. Porigo is cured by applying sheep's gall with simoleon chalk and rubbing the head with the mixture till dry. Chapter 36. Remedies for headache and for wounds on the head. A good remedy for headache are the heads taken from the snails which are found without shells and in an imperfect state. In these heads there is found a hard stony substance about as large as a common pebble. On being extracted from the snail, it is attached to the patient, the smaller snails being pounded and applied to the forehead. Wool grease, too, is used for a similar purpose. The bones of a vulture's head, worn as an amulet, or the brains of that bird, mixed with oil and cedar resin, and applied to the head and introduced into the nostrils. The brains of a crow or owlet are boiled and taken with the food, or a cock is put into a coop and kept without food a day and a night, the patient submitting to a similar abstinence and attaching to his head some feathers plucked from the neck or the comb of the fowl. The ashes, too, of a weasel are applied in the form of a liniment. A twig is taken from a kite's nest and laid beneath the patient's pillow, or a mouse's skin is burnt and the ashes applied with vinegar. Sometimes also the small bone is extracted from the head of a snail that has been found between two cart ruts, and after being passed through a gold ring with a piece of ivory, is attached to the patient in a piece of dog's skin, a remedy well known to most persons and always used with success. For fractures of the cranium, cobwebs are applied with oil and vinegar the application never coming away till a cure has been effected. Cobwebs are good too for stopping the bleeding of wounds made in shaving. Discharges of blood from the brain are arrested by applying the blood of a goose or duck or the grease of those birds with oil of roses. The head of a snail cut off with a reed while feeding in the morning, at full moon more particularly, is attached to the head in a linen cloth with an old thrum for the cure of headache, or else a liniment is made of it and applied with white wax to the forehead. Dog's hairs are worn also attached to the forehead in a cloth. Chapter 37. Remedies for Affections of the Eyelids A crow's brains, taken with the food, they say, will make the eyelashes grow or else wool grease applied with warmed mirror by the aid of a fine probe. A similar result is promised by using the following preparation. Burnt flies and ashes of mouse dung are mixed in equal quantities to the amount of half a denarius in the whole. Two-sixths of a denarius of antimony are then added, and the mixture is applied with wool grease. For the same purpose also, the young ones of a mouse are beaten up in old wine to the consistency of the strengthening preparations known as aopa. When eyelashes are plucked out that are productive of inconvenience, they are prevented from growing again by using a hedgehog's gall, the liquid portion also of a spotted lizard's eggs, the ashes of a burnt salamander, the gall of a green lizard mixed with white wine and left to thicken to the consistency of honey in a copper vessel in the sun. The ashes of a swallow's young mixed with the milky juice of tithymolus, or else the slime of snails. Chapter 38. Remedies for Diseases of the Eyes According to what the magicians say, Glaucoma may be cured by using the brains of a puppy seven days old, 
the probe being inserted in the right side of the eye, if it is the right eye that is being operated on, and in the left side, if it is the left. The fresh gall, too, of the asio is used, a bird belonging to the owlet tribe, with feathers standing erect like ears. Apollonius of Pitani used to prefer dog's gall in combination with honey to that of the hyena for the cure of cataract and also of albugo. The heads and tails of mice reduced to ashes and applied to the eyes improve the sight, it is said, a result which is ensured with even greater certainty by using the ashes of a dormouse or wild mouse or else the brains and gall of an eagle. The ashes and fat of a field mouse, beaten up with attic honey and antimony, are remarkably useful for watery eyes. What this antimony is, we shall have occasion to say when speaking of metals. For the cure of cataract, the ashes of a weasel are used, as also the brains of a lizard or swallow. Weasels, boiled and pounded, and so applied to the forehead, allay defluxions of the eyes, either used alone or else with fine flour or with frankincense. Employed in a similar manner, they are very good for sunstroke, or in other words, for injuries inflicted by the sun. It is a remarkably good plan too to burn these animals alive and to use their ashes with cretan honey as a liniment for films upon the eyes. The cast-off slough of the asp, with the fat of that reptile, forms an excellent ointment for improving the sight in beasts of burden. To burn a viper alive in a new earthen vessel with one cyathus of fennel juice and a single grain of frankincense, and then to anoint the eyes with the mixture, is remarkably good for cataract and films upon the eyes, the preparation being generally known as echion. An eye salve, too, is prepared by leaving a viper to putrefy in an earthen pot and bruising the maggots that breed in it with saffron. A viper, too, is burnt in a vessel with salt, and the preparation is applied to the tip of the tongue to improve the eyesight and to act generally as a corrective of the stomach and other parts of the body. This salt is given also to sheep to preserve them in health and is used as an ingredient in antidotes to the venom of serpents. Some persons again use vipers as an article of food. When this is done, it is recommended, the moment they are killed, to put some salt in the mouth and let it melt there, after which the body must be cut away to the length of four fingers at each extremity, and the intestines being first removed, the remainder boiled in a mixture of water, oil, salt and dill. When thus prepared, they are either eaten at once or else kneaded in a loaf and taken from time to time as wanted. In addition to the above-mentioned properties, viper broth cleanses all parts of the body of lice and removes itching sensations as well upon the surface of the skin. The ashes also of a viper's head used by themselves, are evidently productive of considerable effects. They are employed very advantageously in the form of a liniment for the eyes, and so too is viper's fat. I would not make so bold as to advise what is strongly recommended by some, the use namely of viper's gall, for that, as already stated on a more appropriate occasion, is nothing else but the venom of the serpent. The fat of snakes, mixed with verdigris, heals ruptures of the cuticle of the eyes, and the skin or slough that is cast off in spring, employed as a friction for the eyes, improves the sight. The gall of the boa is highly vaunted for the cure of albugo, cataract, and films upon the eyes, and the fat is thought to improve the sight. The gall of the eagle, which tests its young, as already stated, by making them look upon the sun, forms with attic honey an eye salve which is very good for the cure of webs, films, and cataracts of the eye. 
a vulture's gall too, mixed with leek juice and a little honey, is possessed of similar properties, and the gall of a cock dissolved in water is employed for the cure of argima and albugo. The gall too, of a white cock in particular, is recommended for cataract. For short-sighted persons, the dung of poultry is recommended as a liniment, care being taken to use that of a reddish colour only. A hen's gall, too, is highly spoken of, and the fat, in particular, for the cure of pustules upon the pupils, a purpose for which hens are expressly fattened. This last substance is marvellously useful for ruptures of the coats of the eyes, incorporated with the stones known as schistus and hematites. Hens dung too, but only the white part of it, is kept with old oil in boxes made of horn for the cure of white specks upon the pupil of the eye. When mentioning this subject, it is worthy of remark that peacocks swallow their dung, it is said, as though they envied man the various uses of it. A hawk, boiled in oil of roses, is considered extremely efficacious as a liniment for all affections of the eyes, and so are the ashes of its dung, mixed with attic honey. A kite's liver, too, is highly esteemed, and pigeon's dung, diluted with vinegar, is used as an application for fistulas of the eye, as also for albugo, and marks upon that organ. Goose gall and duck's blood are very useful for contusions of the eyes, care being taken immediately after the application to anoint them with a mixture of wool grease and honey. In similar cases too, gall of partridges is used with an equal quantity of honey. But where it is only wanted to improve the sight, the gall is used alone. It is generally thought too, upon the authority of Hippocrates, that the gall to be used for these purposes should be kept in a silver box. Partridges' eggs, boiled in a copper vessel with honey, are curative of ulcers of the eyes and of glaucoma. For the treatment of bloodshot eyes, the blood of pigeons, ring doves, turtle doves and partridges is remarkably useful, but that of the male pigeon is generally looked upon as the most efficacious. For this purpose, a vein is opened beneath the wing, it being warmer than the rest of the blood, and consequently more beneficial. After it is applied, a compress boiled in honey should be laid upon it, and some greasy wool boiled in oil and wine. Nyctalopy, too, is cured by using the blood of these birds, or the liver of a sheep, the most efficacious being that of a tawny sheep, as already stated by us when speaking of goats. A decoction, too, of the liver is recommended as a wash for the eyes, and for pains and swellings in those organs, the marrow used as a liniment. The eyes of a horned owl, it is strongly asserted, reduced to ashes and mixed in an eye salve, will improve the sight. Albugo is made to disappear by using the dung of turtle doves, snails burnt to ashes, and the dung of the senchus, a kind of hawk, according to the Greeks. All the substances above mentioned used in combination with honey, are curative of argima. Honey, too, in which the bees have died, is remarkably good for the eyes. A person who has eaten the young of the stork will never suffer from ophthalmia for many years to come, it is said, and the same when a person carries about him the head of a dragon. It is stated, too, that the fat of this last-named animal, applied with honey and old oil, will disperse incipient films of the eyes. The young of the swallow are blinded at full moon, and the moment their sight is restored, their heads are burnt, and the ashes are employed with honey to improve the sight, and for the cure of pains, ophthalmia, and contusions of the eyes. Lizards also are employed in numerous ways as a remedy for diseases of the eyes. Some persons enclose a green lizard in a new earthen vessel, together with nine of the small stones known as cynidia, which are usually attached to the body for tumours in the groin, 
Upon each of these stones they make nine marks and remove one from the vessel daily, taking care when the ninth day is come to let the lizard go, the stones being kept as a remedy for affections of the eyes. Others again blind a green lizard and after putting some earth beneath it, enclose it in a glass vessel with some small rings of solid iron or gold. When they find by looking through the glass that the lizard has recovered its sight, they set it at liberty and keep the rings as a preservative against ophthalmia. Others employ the ashes of a lizard's head as a substitute for antimony for the treatment of eruptions of the eyes. Some recommend the ashes of the green lizard with a long neck that is usually found in sandy soils as an application for incipient defluxions of the eyes and for glaucoma. They say too that if the eyes of a weasel are extracted with a pointed instrument, its sight will return, the same use being made of it as of the lizards and rings above mentioned. The right eye of a serpent, worn as an amulet, is very good, it is said, for defluxions of the eyes, due care being taken to set the serpent at liberty after extracting the eye. For continuous watering of the eyes, the ashes of a spotted lizard's head, applied with antimony, are remarkably efficacious. The cobweb of the common fly spider, that which lines its hole more particularly, applied to the forehead, across the temples, in a compress of some kind or other, is said to be marvellously useful for the cure of defluxions of the eyes. The web must be taken, however, and applied by the hands of a boy who has not arrived at the years of puberty. The boy, too, must not show himself to the patient for three days, and during those three days neither of them must touch the ground with his feet uncovered. The white spider, with very elongated, thin legs, beaten up in old oil, forms an ointment which is used for the cure of albugo. The spider, too, whose web of remarkable thickness is generally found adhering to the rafters of houses, applied in a piece of cloth, is said to be curative of defluxions of the eyes. The green scarabaeus, has the property of rendering the sight more piercing of those who gaze upon it. Hence it is that the engravers of precious stones use these insects to steady their sight. Chapter 39. Remedies for Pains and Diseases of the Ears A sheep's gall mixed with honey is a good detergent of the ears. Pains in those organs are allayed by injecting a bitch's milk, and hardness of hearing is removed by using dog's fat with wormwood and old oil, or else goose grease. Some persons add juice of onions and of garlic in equal proportions. The eggs, too, of ants are used by themselves for this purpose, these insects being possessed, in fact, of certain medicinal properties, and bears, it is well known, curing themselves when sick by eating them as food. Goose grease, and indeed that of all birds, is prepared by removing all the veins and leaving the fat in a new shallow earthen vessel, well covered, to melt in the sun, some boiling water being placed beneath it, which done, it is passed through linen strainers, and it is then put by in a cool spot in a new earthen vessel for keeping. With the addition of honey, it is less liable to turn rancid. Ashes of burnt mice injected with honey or boiled with oil of roses allay pains in the ears. In cases where an insect has got into the ears, a most excellent remedy is found in an injection of mouse gall diluted with vinegar. Where too water has made its way into the passages of the ear, goose grease is used in combination with juice of onions. Some persons skin a dormouse and after removing the intestines, boil the body in a new vessel with honey. Medical men, however, prefer boiling it down to one-third with nard, and recommend it to be kept in that state, and to be warmed when wanted, and injected with a syringe. It is a well-known fact that this preparation is an effectual remedy for the most desperate maladies of the ears. 
the same too with an injection of earthworms boiled with goose grease. The redworms also that are found upon trees, beaten up with oil, are a most excellent remedy for ulcerations and ruptures of the ears. Lizards, which have been suspended for some time and dried, with salt in the mouth, are curative of contusions of the ears, and of injuries inflicted by blows. The most efficacious for this purpose are those which have iron-coloured spots upon the skin, and are streaked with lines along the tail. Millipedes, known also as centipedes or multipedes, are insects belonging to the earthworm genus, hairy with numerous feet, forming curves as they crawl, and contracting themselves when touched. The Greeks give to this insect the name of oniscus, others again that of tilos. Boiled with leek juice in a pomegranate rind, it is highly efficacious, they say, for pains in the ears. Oil of roses being added to the preparation, and the mixture injected into the ear opposite to the one affected. As for that kind which does not describe a curve when moving, the Greeks give it the name of seps, while others again call it scolopendra. It is smaller than the former one and is injurious. The snails which are commonly used as food are applied to the ears with myrrh or powdered frankincense, and those with a small broad shell are employed with honey as a liniment for fractured ears. Old sloughs of serpents, burnt in a heated potsherd and mixed with oil of roses, are used as an injection for the ears, which is considered highly efficacious for all affections of those organs and for offensive odours arising therefrom in particular. In cases where there is suppuration of the ears, vinegar is used, and it is still better if goat's gall, ox gall, or that of the sea tortoise is added. This slough, however, is good for nothing when more than a year old. The same too when it has been drenched with rain, as some think. The thick pulp of a spider's body, mixed with oil of roses, is also used for the ears, or else the pulp applied by itself with saffron or in wool. A cricket, too, is dug up with some of its earth and applied. Nigidius attributes great virtues to this insect, and the magician still greater and all because it walks backwards, pierces the earth, and chirrups by night. The mode of catching it is by throwing an ant, made fast with a hair, into its hole, the dust being first blown away to prevent it from concealing itself. The moment it seizes the ant, it is drawn out. The dried craw of poultry, a part that is generally thrown away, is beaten up in wine and injected warm for suppurations of the ears. The same too with the grease of poultry. On pulling off the head of a black beetle, it yields a sort of greasy substance, which, beaten up with rose oil, is marvellously good, they say, for affections of the ears. Care must be taken, however, to remove the wool very soon, or else this substance will be speedily transformed into an animal in the shape of a small grub. Some writers assert that two or three of these insects, boiled in oil, are extremely efficacious for the ears, and that they are good, beaten up and applied in linen for contusions of those organs. This insect also is one of those that are of a disgusting character, but I am obliged by the admiration which I feel for the operations of nature and for the careful researches of the ancients to enter somewhat more at large upon it on the present occasion. Their writers have described several varieties of it. The soft beetle, for instance, which boiled in oil, has been found by experience to be a very useful liniment for warts. Another kind, to which they have given the name of mylacon, is generally found in the vicinity of mills. Deprived of the head, it has been found to be curative of leprosy. At least Musa and Picton have cited instances to that effect. There is a third kind again, odious for its abominable smell and tapering at the posterior extremities. 
used in combination with psyllion. It is curative, they say, of ulcers of a desperate nature, and if kept applied for one and twenty days, for scrofulous sores and inflamed tumours. The legs and wings being first removed, it is employed for the cure of bruises, contusions, cancerous sores, itch scabs, and boils. Remedies, all of them, quite disgusting even to hear of. And yet, by Hercules, Diodorus tells us that he has administered this remedy internally with resin and honey for jaundice and hardness of breathing. Such unlimited power has the medical art to prescribe as a remedy whatever it thinks fit. Physicians who keep more within bounds recommend the ashes of these insects to be kept for these various purposes in a box made of horn, or else that they should be bruised and injected in a lavement for hardness of breathing and catars. At all events, that applied externally they extract foreign substances adhering to the flesh is a fact well known. Honey too, in which the bees have died, is remarkably useful for affections of the ears. Pigeon's dung, applied by itself or with barley meal or oatmeal, reduces impostumes of the parotid glands, a result which is equally obtained by injecting into the ear an owlet's brains or liver mixed with oil or by applying the mixture to the parotid glands, also by applying millipedes with one third part of resin, by using crickets in the form of a liniment or by wearing crickets attached to the body as an amulet. The other kinds of maladies, and the several remedies for them, derived from the same animals or from others of the same class, we shall describe in the succeeding book. Summary Remedies, Narratives and Observations 621 Roman authors quoted M. Varro, L. Piso, Flaccus Verius, Antius, Nigidius, Cassius Hemina, Cicero, Plautus, Celsus, Sextius Niger, who wrote in Greek, Sicilius, the physician, Metellus Scipio, the poet Ovid, Licinius Masser. Foreign authors quoted Homer, Aristotle, Orpheus, Palaephatus, Democritus, Anaxilaus. Medical authors quoted Botrus, Apollodorus, Archidemus, Aristogenes, Xenocrates, Democrates, Diodorus, Chrysippus the philosopher, Horus, Nicander, Apollonius of Pitani. End of section 17